Ah, 2020, the Jimmy Savile of years. Only after its passing can we take stock and truly appreciate the flood of hushed up sexual assault accusations. You know, every time I take a stab at summarising Bug Snacks, I feel like something important has been left out. It's like writing a real estate profile for a nuclear bunker on Mars where 11 people died of asbestos poisoning. If I were to say it's a first person adventure sort of thing where you come to a hidden island full of mysterious creatures that are all a hybrid of an insect and an item of snack food, like a fucking bag of chips with wings and shit, and there's influence from Pokemon because they all have a cutesy hybrid name that is the only thing they can say, and catching them is the main gameplay activity, but unlike Pokemon you don't battle them, you just watch them get mercilessly devoured as they scream their own names in distress. Even that summary fails to mention the significant fact that all the sentient characters in the game are furry puppet monsters that look like novelty butt plugs based on Sesame Street characters. Oh, so it's a kid's game yard. I don't know. You can't capture them until you put them out, so you use their favourite sauce to lure them into water, or an ice cream based bug snacks, as our protagonist's furry biology seems to lack the facility to piss. So, on the one hand, this is a collection based puzzle game in which one literally gotta catch them all, then serve em all with fries and a soft drink, but on the other hand, there doesn't feel like there's much incentive to catch em all unless a quest specifically asks for em. The mechanics are a bit disconnected, all you can do with a bug snacks once caught is feed them to someone to make their toenails turn into Oreos or whatever, which is only an aesthetic change, and now I'm writing all this down perhaps a slightly fetishistic one. On the whole though, Bug Snacks has the charm of a banana and crisp sandwich and has a similarly unique enough combination of flavours to be worth a try for curiosity's sake. Plus, asking the creative leads to explain the inspiration behind it would provide a lot of useful material if you're looking to have them sectioned for whatever reason. Things quickly turned sour when I started the first level and Mr. Boy immediately sprinted to the right without me asking. At first I thought I'd left my drinking gun on the keyboard again, but no. Don't tell me you've turned Super Meat Boy into an infinite runner. No, of course not. The levels are finite. They're just procedurally generated. Oh, even better! The most tired trend of indie games, and the most tired trend of mobile games together at last, to squirt out a little narcoleptic baby. And this provides a lovely opportunity to put a certain device on my head and escape to a wonderful land far from the troubles of reality. No, I'm not talking about hanging myself, but checking in on the world of VR. The latest addition to AAA dabblings in the VR space is Medal of Honor Above and Beyond, a fantastical alternate history game about how Germany somehow gets taken over by a fascist government and a coalition of Western powers form an ideological alliance to stop their aggressive expansion across Europe. Kuh, what an imagination those fellas at Respawn Entertainment have. Imagine a first world power actually engaging in war for ideological reasons and not because they can use it to divert money to some of their cunt friends. My interest was raised further when I went to install the game and it was 130 effing gig! That's like three Last of Us 2s. That surprises me, Medal of Honor, Abbott and Costello, because I'm looking at your trailers and screenshots and your graphics kinda look like last gen dog shit. So if you have filled your game with 130 gigs worth of that dog shit, why you must have rendered a playing space the size of the fucking Death Star? The graphics are, as a great man very recently said, dog shit. At one point I was looking down at Omaha Beach from a recently liberated pillbox and thinking, hmm, I'm no historian, but I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be some soldiers running up that thing right about now. The guns are going for the historical accuracy the World War II shooter fans are weirdly insistent on, so remember every mission to switch to the MP40 first chance you get, cause those Nazis might not have known much about race relations but they jolly well knew how to design a machine gun by Jingo, where the gameplay consists largely of moving to the next room and shooting another handful of newly spawned Nazis, who all have AI granting them the self-preservation instincts of moths in a pizza oven. There's one level set on a train, that's the absolute epitome of this. Shoot two guys, move to the next carriage, shoot two guys, move to the next carriage. Christ, this is retroactively sucking the fun out of every good train level I've ever played. Hey, why is the chef in the dining car trying to shoot me? I asked because at the start of the level I was specifically told not to shoot the train driver because he was a conscripted civvy. Bit inconsistent? Are you telling me the Nazi party made sure to win over the fucking patisseries before the essential transport workers? You can tackle them in any order and go back and forth as much as you like, which creates the usual issue that they all have to have roughly the same difficulties and once you're in the late game and have fully upgraded your suppository equipment, then the last few areas roll over like a friendly dog with an itchy back. In fact, the final boss of almost every area is a complete cop-out, generally too easy and often a gimmick boss, like the Dragon God, who looks terrifying and is the size of your mum's buffet place, but is actually a proto-bed of chaos, and he's only harder than fighting a kitten in a blender because you have to press two buttons instead of one. Then there's Latria, which is one of the harder worlds, full of striking, horrific Lovecraftian visuals, and then at the end of it you just fight some random cunt with a walnut whip for a head. It's only the final boss of the first area that puts up a decent scrap, and of course he's the one who's an infuriatingly long way from the last checkpoint, and every time you want to face him you have to plough through three castles, one dragon, and an elevator ride slow enough to pitch an entire Hideo Kojima project. Oh and I won't spoil it, but as for the final final boss of the game, I've had bigger struggles working caramel out of my teeth. In Dark Souls you use Titanite shards to upgrade your weapon some of the way and then you have to use the rarer large Titanite shards instead. This is a fine system. In Demon Souls, once your weapon is upgraded past a certain point you have to use both small shards and large shards. This is a bad system, designed by evil footwear companies who want you to wear out your shoes grinding small shards in old areas, or going back and forth buying them in bulk 
balked from that weird bloke who looks like Charlie Manson taking a beach holiday. As for the other new missions, there's not a whole lot that doesn't feel like treading familiar ground. The highlight is a mission set in a British stately home, where 47 can solve an unrelated tea time murder mystery, and it's like an Agatha Christie story that for some reason ends with Poirot hanging around after the parlour scene so he can fling someone off a balcony. But these so-called mission stories are, frankly, the worst parts of the game. I think that's the revelation I finally came to after speeding through all the missions, getting handheld through a linear sequence of objectives where I follow my intended victim around for a while, until the moment they say, all security guards leave the room so I can have some alone time with my new best pal. Would you like to admire my new pit full of rotating knives? I thought it would make a nice centrepiece. It feels like mum and dad doing our homework for us and it makes the bottom drop out of all the tension and immersion. Especially since they very often hinge on Agent 47 disguising himself as someone famous or who the victim has already met, rather than a random background employee, and them somehow not noticing that this person they know is suddenly built like a gravedigger's shovel leaning on a tombstone and keeps responding to direct questions with veiled references to being an assassin. Can I tell you a secret? Oh, I guarantee it won't leave this room. Do you recommend the soup? I'd have to say it's to die for. Blimey, my Verrucas are playing up. Perhaps you'd like to lie down after I murder you completely to death. You know what, Konami? I don't even care about Silent Hill anymore. You make all the pachinko machines and arcade shooters and pyramid head-shaped suppository kits you like. I loved Silent Hill once, but you know what? Getting as attached to name franchises is how they get you. That's why Disney can sell haunted Zyklon B canisters just by sticking C-3PO on the front. I don't want a new Silent Hill. I want interesting new horror games that benefit from Silent Hill's influence. I like bands influenced by Nirvana, but I wouldn't like it if they nailed Kurt Cobain's body to the front of the drum kit. Well, you're in luck, Yahtzee, mid driveling old game review in Giant Sea Turtle because here's the medium, a new original survival horror game not only inspired by Silent Hill, but featuring music from Akira Yamoka himself. Yeah, all the shitty Silent Hills had music from Akira Yamoka. So did the Dead by Daylight expansion, and Shadows of the Damned, and World of Tanks? Akira Yamoka apparently has trouble saying no to people. And why are you trying to cover the developer logo? Um, because it's by Bloober Team. Ugh, fucking walking simulator merchants. Wish they'd simulate walking over to a fucking whiteboard and coming up with some new ideas for once. The running theme of my time with the medium is that I always felt like I was more skating along the top of it than getting immersed. First, the gameplay didn't grab me. It's the usual survival horror inventory puzzle stuff. Explore environment, find a door blocked by rabid polecat, explore a bit more, find a can of rabid polecat repellent, etc. But the level design constantly herds us towards progress, and I never felt like I was the one coming up with the solutions. Case in point, there's a bit where the recurring monster is stomping about and we have to evade it until we find a way to restart a generator, at which point main character lady says, aha, now I can turn the tables on the monster. And I was like, you can? It's really not clear how. You're gonna plug in a karaoke machine and challenge it to a something stupid off? The medium has good visual design and atmosphere, but I wasn't thinking about those during my suddenly much freer afternoon. I was wondering why Violent Ballistic Death leapt that quickly to the top of Marianne's proposed solutions list. Just felt really out of nowhere. Failure of characterization, I suppose. The suicide ending made sense in Spec Ops The Line and Silent Hill 2 and my last school reunion. Hey, people who like pen and paper role-playing, stop dazzling the world of fashion with your presence for a moment and listen. Have you ever thought that the campaign you're part of might work really well if adapted into a book or video game plot? Well, apply this simple test. Go to literally anyone in the world and tell them about the most interesting thing that's ever happened in your game. Shortly, you will notice that their eyes appear to be focused on a point six feet behind your head, and they keep saying things like, uh-huh, and right, and if you don't stop talking, I'm going to scrape out my own eardrums with a teaspoon handle, you tedious, tedious fuck. But even for mid-range Eurojank, I struggle to think of any game whose core gameplay is more completely at odds with the themes of its plot and abilities of its main character. I mean, here's this dude who can turn into either a rampaging wolf monster or a lithe normal wolf that can dash through the wilderness faster than an enchilada through an elderly relative's digestive system, and then he spends most of his time crouching behind cumicle dividers in cramped metal rooms, like a scoliosis sufferer queuing to go on Space Mountain. Every cocking part of this game takes place in some kind of industrial environment consisting of a string of sectioned off metal rooms containing an arrangement of cubicle dividers and patrolling guards. It's like playing Pac-Man, except when you get caught you can't continue until you've smashed up the arcade cabinet with gardening equipment. Equipment. So a good question to ask would be why one should bother going out of one's way to stealth through the game when one can rip through the guards in 10 seconds flat, and no guards in any subsequent arena will be alerted because I guess the evil corporation sold everyone's two-way radios to add soundproofing to all the walls. Or indeed why we should bother with trying to find the secret computer rooms where we can deactivate like one security camera, thus using three minutes of work to delay by two minutes the frequently inevitable descent into 10 seconds of combat. Unless we're the game's mum and want to encourage its ambitions to be an immersive sim, which is admittedly adorable, there's a small handful of bits in the game where you can complete optional scavenger hunts and dialogue puzzles to get past certain areas without fighting, and I'm like, oh, look at the little puppy that thinks it's Deus Ex, and look at that adorable upgrade menu with like nine things on it. Yes, you're an RPG, aren't you? Well, how would you fix it, Yards? Well, I'd have added some kind of consequence for using frenzy mode too much, like reduced XP or a bad ending, or focused on cathartic combat and chucked the humanity questioning stuff in the recycle bin. Oh wait, even quicker solution, chuck the whole fucking game in the recycle bin and play something else. Be serious, Yards. Sorry, I meant to say compost 
lost bin. It's not that I dislike survival crafting as a genre, I just don't feel like it's taught me any practical survival skills. I head out to the wilderness, gather some wood and some stone, pack them together and tuck them under my scrotum for five seconds, and the result is not a makeshift axe, but an awkward conversation with my prostate specialist. But anyway, this week I've been playing an indie survival craft em up called Breath Edge, which is Subnautica but in space. Why yes, I am that very thing, Yats. In fact, I contain multiple direct references to Subnautica to acknowledge its influence. You know, you're really sucking the fun out of dismissive know-it-all assholery, Breath Edge. But yes, take Subnautica and remove all the water so that nothing remains but cold forbidding vacuum, and that's Breath Edge. And while you're at it, remove the interesting story and any particular reason to engage with its base building mechanics. Wait, I liked those! You removed too much, Breath Edge. Ooh, sorry, I guess I'll fill in the gap with fourth wall breaking humour that over the course of the game gradually, almost imperceptibly, moves over the line from amusing to insufferable. But while a fourth wall break is surprising and funny, all subsequent fourth wall breaks is just waving your comedy hammer at empty air. And the omnipresent fast talking AI narrator who flits back and forth between doing a comedy motormouth bit and just talking too fast because they're not a very good voice actor really starts to grate when they constantly point out all the gags. Oh no, you can't get past here without crafting another piece of arbitrary bullshit. The developers, who are me, who are writing these words that I'm saying, must be trying to pad the gameplay out. What a bunch of scams. Oh look, it looks like something is about to happen. Oh my goodness, the thing we were all expecting didn't happen the way we were expecting it. What a clever subversion on the part of the developers who are writing these words. See, there's poking fun at yourself, and then there's poking a finger so far up yourself you can pull undigested Cheerios out of this morning's breakfast. Is it me, or is there a lot of dead weight in the Phantom Thieves? I suppose once you've watched someone awaken their persona while dramatically screaming and ripping their face off and bursting into flames, probably a bit awkward at that point to say, sorry, party's full, but we'll keep your resume on file. Anyway, Joker, the young hero whose appearance is ripped from a generation of teenage girls' erotic Harry Potter fantasies, reunites with the Scooby Gang for their summer holiday. And what an appropriate time of year you've picked for the release of this one, Atlas, I must say. Watching Joker enjoy a sizzling summer beach festival while I huddle under six dogs for warmth. As I say, they're trying to recreate the Persona feel, and I suppose it wouldn't be Persona if it didn't unnecessarily dick you about here and there. But the point is, Persona 5 Strikers is very much for the fans, and my recommendation depends on how many Joker Funko Pops you have in your living space. The Phantom Thieves are all post-character development BFFs, so they just move through the plot as a giant eight-headed mass, with very little interpersonal conflict. So while the fans might like to see all the old faces getting along and going through a slightly anomalously large number of bathhouse and beach scenes, it might lose a general audience. Bear that in mind as I say the following. I, someone who enjoyed Persona 5, also enjoyed Persona 5 Strikers. In closing, I'd like to repeat something I once said about the Yakuza games. Isn't it odd how contemporary Japanese games always feel like they have to sell Japan as well? The way the Phantom Thieves stop at every tourist hotspot and have many prolonged scenes of them scarfing down the local cuisine. It's like the game's designed for foreign tourists. Maybe it's just the difference in culture standing out more to me as an outsider. But it feels like if every game set in America had characters going, oh boy, I can't wait to go to McDonald's for one of our famous Big Macs, and then go down to the Walmart and watch the traditional running of the shitheads. Okay, I looked this up and I think I've got the details square. The popular and influential Japanese cutesy farming sim franchise Farm Story was published by Natsume in the West under the name Harvest Moon. In 2014, the developer switched publishers and its games have since been released in the West under the name Story of Seasons because Natsume reserved the rights to the name Harvest Moon so that they could make their own rival cutesy farming games and call them Harvest Moon because they assume those fat ignorant westerners have reservoirs of cream gravy instead of brains and won't know the difference. Well, just dip a biscuit in my skull because I tried out the new Harvest Moon on Switch. I enjoyed Harvest Moon back on the SNES and have clocked in enough hours in Stardew Valley to raise an actual child or moderately sized dog, so I was curious to see in precisely what manner Natsume was buggering the franchise's reputation over a feeding trough. Quite heartily, it turns out. This society that failed to develop agriculture has mastered miniaturization technology. You know, it's like when you play Civilization against someone who researches nuclear fission before they've discovered the wheel. Because of this, you can pack up all your farm buildings into a convenient package and go establish yourself at one of several predetermined spots throughout the world because this society has also failed to develop the concept of land ownership, apparently. But isn't the point of these types of farming simulators to build something and watch it grow from a humble turnip patch in the backwoods to the primary agribusiness concern of anime thirsty ladies ville? You don't get that when you're having to uproot yourself every few hours so you can move to a new area with a different colour repeated ground texture, another two or three inflatable NPCs to load you down with more fucking fetch quests, and another couple of thirsty love interest characters about as romantically intriguing as a plank with a bad haircut. You can't really choose what seeds you get, you pick them up randomly one at a time from passing gnomes, which is very annoying if you're trying to fill a quota, like the story mission that required me to grow three watermelons. I turned over every gnome in the fucking place, and when I finally found watermelon seeds, I'd wait for them to grow, and then the game went, oh, you're so good at growing melons, this melon randomly turned into a special melon. Which doesn't count towards the quest quota, so I guess it's back to the gnomes with you. And don't get me started on the fishing, because I just started anyway, it'd be redundant. Ooh, that's a nice big silhouette of a fish in that water, say I, forgetting that this isn't Animal Crossing, because after I drop in my line, all those enticing silhouettes disappear, and a random, generally much piddlier one appears for you to catch. Then you have to press a button when the little fish icon moves past a bar, but the icon can change direction at literally any moment, and if you press wrong, then bye suckers, stole your bait. And then 90% of the time it's a fucking sardine that sell for so fucking little I might as well have spent the time charging truckers for disappointing hand jobs. And what 
appropriate month this is for our first game, Loop Hero, a game about marching. Marching around and around in a circle, or rather watching someone else march around and around in a circle while we occasionally fling them a new pair of trousers and dream silly silly dreams about what it would be like to be the one playing the video game. The premise is, you are a lone hero in a world that has been destroyed, like really really thoroughly. Everything has been reduced to a void, it's like watching network television at 10 in the morning. All that remains is a single looping path and all you can do is follow it and bit by bit remember the world as it used to be. Although I guess your memory isn't the best, because you can only remember it in a rather muddy 16-bit art style with slightly hard to read text, reminiscent of one of those depressing Amiga games from the 90s, designed by sad British people who live in places like Hull. It's like taking a somewhat interesting book and systematically removing all the pages with a very slow angle grinder. So let's move on to the other game I played, which not only falls under the same category of retro-style game taking place primarily in Black Void, but by extraordinary coincidence is also an anagram of Loop Hero if you change some of the letters and don't know what an anagram is. If I were lazy game journalist scum working for some desperately irrelevant gaming news source, I'd probably describe Everhood as Undertale on LSD, meaning that it has no consistent colour scheme besides eye-gougingly vibrant, and they're really proud of some Unity plugins they found that make the screen go all wibbly-wobbly. Speaking as an extremely clever person, I feel a bit personally attacked by the concept of an evil genius. Anti-intellectualism is rife in the world today, encouraged no small amount by a media concerned that their advertisers' claims that their breakfast cereal induces hallucinogenic bliss in woodland creatures might not hold up to rigorous academic study. Well let's see how far your fucking street smarts and common sense get you when you need someone to figure out how to turn a city-sized clod of oceanic waste plastic into drinkable water and hospital-grade insulin. Just because I'm smarter than everyone else doesn't mean I look down on people. Someone has to make my sandwiches. Just because I can envision a vastly more efficient society with myself as absolute dictator doesn't mean I want to go to that amount of trouble. Just because I ordered the installation of an oubliette in my basement doesn't mean I have sinister intentions for it. So stop asking questions and get your jackhammer out, Frank. Being able to select a minion and directly order them to do something would make all the difference when you find yet another squad of investigators freely walking around your base, snapping away like Japanese tourists while the eight elite mercenaries I painstakingly trained are all sitting in the security room playing Magic the Gathering. Suddenly the hands-off approach is out the window as I need to specifically click on each intruder and select kill, at which point it turns out that only half the bloody mercenaries decided to pick up one of the bloody guns I spent ages bloody researching and developing because the gun cabinet was more than three feet away and their fingers were slippery with Cheeto dust. Then when all seemed lost, the super agent breached my evil genius's lair and my evil genius just fucking took them apart. And that kind of killed my interest in playing any longer, frankly, because doesn't it undermine the whole theme of delegating and the challenge of building a base to protect myself? Why bother if I can just stick my main dude behind the reception desk and open fire every time the front door opens? What you'd gain in efficiency will balance out what you lose in getting blacklisted by DoorDash. So after I reviewed Harvest Moon one star a few weeks back and said it was the imperfect pod person replica of the original franchise that got rejected for forgetting to glue its nose on properly and that you should probably hold out for the new story of seasons, I immediately realised, oh crunchy nut bugger flakes, I've tied my hands on this one haven't I? I basically endorsed story of seasons pioneers of Olive Town sight unseen, so now I have to review it to make sure it doesn't leave skid marks on the guest towels. I mean I go around town for the first day's waifu hunt and all I have to go on are a bunch of tottering dead-eyed brats doll mascots that cause nary a stir in my character's humble flaxen underpants, and they don't even have attractive 2D portraits of the characters to throw on top of their dialogue boxes, so you can get a feel for how they'd look once you've got a serious set of beer goggles on. In the end I zeroed in on the one lady who appraises relics you find in the mine, just because I was seeing her every day anyway, when I dropped off that day's sack load of earth caked garbage. It's hard to feel electrified with romance settling for the girl I would have no reason to interact with were I to just buy my own fucking pressure washer. But who the fuck's demanding innovation from their light farming sims? As I say, the formula's pretty much down, so it's like trying to liven up a perfectly good money shot by using spicy mustard instead of Come. I also have a specific bubble in my catheter tube about coal. You need coal to power certain machines, but I tried to stick some coal I found in the mine into one and it slapped my hand away. No, I only want refined coal. So a little surging around later, I discovered a crafting recipe that I picked up without realising that turned one piece of raw coal into one piece of refined coal. If you needed more than one raw coal to make refined coal, or if there were other things you could do with raw coal besides make refined coal, then this would be a gameplay mechanic. As it stands, it's just pissing about. My gut tells me this game is simultaneously a bit too slow and a bit too fast. Does your gut want to clarify that, Yards? Well, I don't want to push him, we had Mexican last night. Blimey, I thought video games were supposed to be violent. I've been doing so little killing lately, I'm becoming dangerously well-adjusted. Just look at my last few reviews. Idle games, management games, farming sims. Last night a stray cat came into my front garden and I didn't stomp it to death. High time for some good old-fashioned mindless violence, and who better to provide it than People Can Fly, the developers behind Painkiller, old school boomer shooter from before old school boomer shooters were wallpapering the fucking rumpers room, and more recently of Bulletstorm, quirky tongue-in-cheek spectacle shooter that's like 
years of war trying desperately to loosen up at an office Christmas party. I could certainly trust them to provide a murder simulator that's at least interesting to talk about, and not another bloody multiplayer-focused looter-shooter with endless copy-pasted bullet sponge baddies and a cover art depicting some smug people walking slowly towards the camera. Isn't that right, people can fly? Yeah, I know Outriders is all the things I just said. I was doing a little funny. Wipe that puppy dog look off your face. I love when review codes of games come with a little review guide, telling you how proud the creators are of their products and what specific parts they'd most like you to gush about in your effusively praiseful review. It's amusing to me that they think I'm capable of guilt. It's like playing football, you know, if you let something inflate itself first, you'll have a lot more fun kicking it in the face. Outriders Blurb Files has a couple of interesting things. Firstly, that it can be completely enjoyed in single player, which is always a wonderful excuse to test that claim. Does this mean you have an offline mode, Outriders? Oh, <laughs> it's good that we can still have fun, Yahtzee. Another interesting thing admitted in the Outriders Review Guide is that, quote, it may look like a looter shooter on the surface, and many players may compare Outriders to a looter shooter. Many players people can fly, implying that some of them don't. Have those people gotten their eyes checked lately? Because that's a cause for concern. I haven't seen pussy footing like this since the last time I refereed a women's kickboxing tournament. I'm going to stream some inconvenient truth piss into your letterbox now, AAA games industry. It is not possible for any game to be equally enjoyable in both single and multiplayer. You can optimize the experience for one or the other, but never both. And the sooner you stop trying to cover all possible audiences at once with the same great big money-making hat, the better. The sooner the multiplayer likers can go back to having games like Team Fortress where different classes have different skill sets, and the gameplay is built around having to rely on each other to compensate for individual shortfalls, rather than making every class mealy-mouthed, basically okay at everything, straight B students bound for the inevitable rude awakening once they get to college, and the single-player likers can go back to being able to enjoy the story and challenge at their own pace and sing dirty limericks to themselves without upsetting everyone in the voice chat and fucking pause the game! Sorry, a bit of a tangent there. Normally I'd summarise my feelings about Outriders at this point, but unfortunately my opinion is currently down due to server issues. Figuring out how best to navigate your dudes past a few screens of hazards when your dudes have all the facility for self-preservation as a blind hedgehog on a turnpike. Bearing that in mind, when I fuck up in a puzzle game, I want to feel like it was because I wasn't smart enough, not because some element of the game decided not to work the way it had worked before. Sometimes your followers' neurons will fire fast enough to run past the ceiling crusher when you tell them to, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll all hide in a locker when you tell them to, sometimes they won't. And when the enemy patrol turns around, they all get shot dead before they even have time to show their hall pass. Sometimes the enemy patrol turns around and shoots you dead, sometimes they don't, because their AI fucked up and they've stopped moving altogether. Which gets particularly farcical if you've dropped a mine on their patrol path. Boy, that was some really impressive patrolling up to now, can't wait to see it again. Oh my goodness, is that a reunion performance of the three tenors going on behind you? Boy, missing out on that would haunt me to my dying days. So when my editor asked me to check out It Takes Two, a two and strictly only two player game, I was like, I'm down for that, as long as it's not like that last strictly two player game I played, the laughably awful A Way Out by Hazelight Studios, which played like if David Cage tried to adapt to the Shawshank Redemption, realised it wasn't long enough and filled in the rest of the time with three random DVDs he found in a bargain bin. Who's this new game by anyway? Oh, Hazelight Studios. Well, that might have been embarrassing for someone capable of shame. The parents must then work together to find a way back to normal by navigating abstract puzzle platforming fantasy worlds based on aspects of their family home, which appears to have been about the size of Windsor fucking Castle, harangued from start to finish by an omnipotent self-help book with a slightly racist accent, whom you and the protagonists will swiftly want to murder. In fact, I'd have given the game's story more points if it had ended with the family finally coming together over a cheerful backyard book burning. So the dialogue's a bit cringe, worthy, cringe-worthy, worth cringing about, that is the word. Who's this fucker's been going around telling you you can use cringe by itself as an adjective? The bottom line is, it's a game throwing an awful lot of shit at the wall, a lot of which doesn't stick, but enough of it does, and moment-to-moment -moment gameplays as tight as a gnat's arse. I just wrote a compliment that included the words arse, shit, and bottom, and that's why I'm a professional, kids. Look at you all asking me to play Balan Wonderworld and getting your phone cameras ready like you've just put a smash cake in front of a tiny baby. That title's a gift, isn't it? Banal Wonderworld, Whirly Blunder Bland, Anal Wanky Piss. But you know, bloody blinded contrarian that I am, I feel inclined to be charitable towards something everyone already says is a great big bag of salt and vinegar shit crisps. And I can honestly say, badly designed and incomprehensible though it is, I don't feel much hate or anger towards Balan Thunderpants. Just a mixture of confusion and embarrassment, like what I felt when my dad announced he'd gotten a job as a Playboy bunny. You play as either big eyed girl with personal issues, or big-eyed boy with personal issues, who stumbles into some kind of mysterious funhouse run by the titular Balan, who looks like what you'd get if Willy Wonka turned into a Pokemon, we are then dumped into a hub world where we get followed around a meadow by several pastel-coloured tribbles. From there we embark upon a series of abstract platforming levels, apparently based upon the psyche of a random person in the real world, who is shown in a cutscene experiencing some extremely banal difficulty in life, like chess player doesn't win at chess, or bug collector's school friends think bug collecting is a bit weird, then we fight an elaborate symbolic boss, then we watch a cutscene of the person overcoming their 
difficulty, then they and the protagonist meet up and launch into a choreographed dance number. This all happens with no dialogue, possibly as an attempt at purely visual storytelling or to cheap out on the translation budget. But listen here, Yuji Naka, a three-panel comic strip about Snoopy wanting his dinner can get by without dialogue. You need to sit down and answer a few fucking questions. What the fuck's going on? Who's the dude who looks like if Robert Smith from The Cure turned into a Pokemon? Is he supposed to be the Satan-like villain who's causing everyone's problems in an attempt to sow discord in the world of men? Because the problems are so mundane I kind of feel bad for the guy. He's clearly gotten way overdressed for the occasion, and every time he shows up in gameplay he gets his dark and brooding bum cheeks handed to him in two minutes flat. There's a lot of pointless scarcity. To pick up a costume you need a single-use key, but there's almost always one in the same room, which respawns after you pick it up, so what is the fucking point of locking the costume at all? Also, you don't just have a costume once you've found it. Fall off a ledge or get hit once and you lose your current costume. And if it's a costume from a different world that you brought along to use in a highly specific situation to get one of the hidden gold trophies, you need to progress in the game. The way it worked in Sonic Unleashed and it was annoying as asbestos buggery back then too. I've lost the thread of this run-on sentence, let's just end it on something that sounds vaguely funny. Waffle bogeys. On top of that, it's also easy to accidentally lose costumes because you can only carry three and picking one up kicks out whichever one you have in the third spot. That's right, the inventory system from Treasure Island Dizzy, I'm glad we all remember it. At some point, someone pointed out to the six-year-old that we only ever see the player character in the germophobic porn studio fluffer or whoever else currently needs their bullshit problem fixed, and the game's title character doesn't seem to be involved much. And the six-year-old panics and threw his juice box because everyone needs to see how cool their character is, so every level features several unrelated asides, where we have to watch Balan fly around space punching rocks and the Robert Smith dude while we press quick time events. These sequences are all basically the same and go on way longer than they need to, in that they don't need to exist at all, so that's like infinite percent too long, mathematically speaking. And if you don't hit all the quick time events perfectly, you don't get the gold trophy what you need to progress. So as far as the game's concerned, three perfects and a very good is no different to spending the whole sequence rubbing the controller on your buttocks. So on this one specific point, Balan Wonderworld can eat shit. At the start of Resident Evil Village, Ethan, unluckiest chump in the Western Hemisphere winters, is lounging around the house with his wife and baby, thinking he's getting impaled on things days are behind him, when of all people, Chris Redfield bursts in, shoots Mrs. Winters dead and kidnaps the baby. This, boys and girls, is what we call a hook. But don't worry, it's like what they used to do with superhero comics, where the cover shows Superman about to drop kick a baby into a volcano or something, to force you to buy the comic and discover, oh, turns out all along it was a volcano-shaped sweet shop and it's the baby's birthday. So obviously there's an explanation for Chris's actions, one that I feel he could have summarised to Ethan easily enough before or during the home invasion, without having to beat him unconscious with a rifle butt. Chris just felt like being a real dick about it for some reason, maybe he couldn't find a boulder to punch that morning. Hey, we should probably do something to seem like we're not just entirely copying RE4's homework. Hmm, what's the exact opposite of a tiny castle-owning man? A giant castle-owning woman! Genius! Fish fingers all round. Yeah, sorry if you got into that whole meme that arose around Lady Dimitrisk, because whoops, she's only the boss of the first area, she dies like two hours in, and then it's back to fantasising about your high school French teacher in a milkmaid outfit. Four and seven were good for different reasons. Four was amusingly camp and action-focused and grand in scope, but seven was survival-focused and benefited from a narrowing of scope that made it effectively unnerving. Eight, as a result, is a severely mixed bag. How mixed? Put it like this. There is a moment in Villa Lillage that was the most genuinely terrifying horror experience I've had in a video game for a very long time. There is another moment, sometime later, where you're in a dreary repetitive industrial environment fighting cyborgs, and it's about as scary and exciting as trying to squeeze past a Borg cosplayer on a narrow staircase. And when I say moment, I mean about an hour. This is part of the decline the game suffers after Mommy Milkies has spooged herself out of the game, and after the really effective horror part. It's the bit in the dollhouse, alright? I presume it's okay for a review to identify the bit it's praising. I don't know, you people cry spoilers if I so much as tell you Ethan Winter's inside leg measurement. Every now and again it pulls its head out of its bum for one game, but just can't resist that wonderful butthole smell, and is six inches deep again by the sequel. So of course we discover how the events of the last two games tie into the fucking Umbrella Corporation, and there's a new bonkers global conspiracy to create monsters and sell them as weapons, because it's nice how guns straightforwardly murder whatever we point them at, but maybe if there was a chance your weapon could turn around and suck your eyeballs out, then that'd add enough je ne sais quoi to stand out in a competitive marketplace. It's like Resident Evil is a restaurant that's been trying to sell octopus burgers, and no one fucking likes the octopus burgers because they're slimy and weird, and the eyeballs look like they're judging me. So then they bring out a nice burger with no octopus, and it sells really well, and the managers all go, great, now how do we work the octopus? back into this. Forget about the fucking octopus! The octopus doesn't work! Why do you always insist on pushing the octopus? Are you trying to launder a marine life smuggling enterprise? Actually, that does raise the awkward question of what the fuck kind of animal we are playing in Biomutant. Best guess, a sort of hyena, cat, leopard, raccoon, lemur sloth. Like we were conceived at the Lion King rap party and nobody was willing to claim parentage. I hate when a game forces me to make a whole bunch of character building decisions before I know the first fucking thing about the game. Do you want to put points into intelligence? I don't know, do I? I mean, how much intelligence does it generally take to hold a big knife by the non-ouchy part and stick it in everything softer than a tree trunk? What about charisma? It makes it easier to pass persuasion checks. But how often does that come up? Is this one 
one of those RPGs where high charisma is the secret easy mode? Or one where any build not spec'd for combat is going to get chumped like a concerned parent at an after-school knife fighting club? Spoiler alert, it's the second one. But even if they'd gotten in the fucking Royal Shakespeare Company, it wouldn't help, because the plot comes at you like a two-foot-high sandwich to an unprepared jaw. You start off in a bunker, and then you rescue a dude from some standard enemies, and he informs you that your parents and home village were murdered by a monstrous villain and you want revenge. Oh, thank you for jogging my memory, you know how these things slip my mind. Except, I don't think that's actually the plot. The plot seems to be, you have involunteered to save the world by restoring the Tree of Life, or possibly by destroying the Tree of Life. Oh yes, we have to pick a path on the ever unsubtle black and white moral spectrum, where the choice is either friendship and hugs or violence and power bombs, and every single fucking character in the game feels entitled to judge you on which path you're heading down. That is assuming the narrator is to be believed, they might all be taking the piss out of my eye patch for all I know. So the Tree of Life is important somehow, and it has four roots, and one to the west is being ravaged by the evil Fluffy Muffy, but Pongo is building a nutbanger device that you can use to wrongle the Binky Bonk before going to the second route in the north, which is being splat blobbed by the Nicky Nacky Noo. Hold the fuck up! Your story by a mutant could at least have the decency to buy me dinner before it spooges all of itself over my face at once. But there are some new features, most notably the main character has a miraculous and innovative new piece of equipment called a personality. Robin, for it is her name, comes to an alien ice planet to uncover the truth behind the death of her sister. The evil corporation that runs the Subnautica universe keeps saying it was an accident, but every time they say it they sort of very unsubtly wink to someone standing off to the side, so obviously we're going to trust them about as far as the distance between a Catholic school teacher's knees. But though there's a bit where you ride a snow speeder through icy wasteland while being chased by one of Godzilla's more unruly turds that shows up in the promotional art a lot, but it's more a gimmicky interlude than an integral new mechanic. I mean, if the most interesting new feature of a game called Subnautica takes place on dry land, then it sounds like something's gone wrong somewhere. Still, even in a vacuum it's not that interesting. You ride along, the giant worm pops out, you fall off your speeder, the worm wiggles his big glowy bum at you with the malicious pleasure of a house cat knocking a cup off a desk, you get back on the speeder, repeat. If the whole game were a cheeseburger it'd be the pickle, if that. It might just be the sesame seeds on the bun, or the brief pang of guilt from your contribution to the deleterious effect meat production has on the environment. But fully customizable, so if you don't want 19 fucking lockers in the thing, constantly reminding you of how many people failed to come to your last birthday party, then you can crash. I'm sorry, what? Crash. The game crashed. I should mention I was playing the PS5 version because it was the code I was given and might as well get some fucking use out of that glorified factory warped panini press. And this version seems to be a bit buggy. It occasionally crashes to I hesitate to use the word desktop. So when was my last autosave subnautical below zero? Autosave? What's that? Is that like runners high but for goalkeepers? Sudden change of expression, sound of distant breaking glass? You don't have autosave, but I've been playing for like four hours. I built half my base. I found some really hard to find things. I made friends with a shark and named it Porthos. What do I do now? I don't know, eat shit by the sounds of it. So yeah, it's more Subnautica with some bits bolted on, and maybe that's enough, but for fuck's sake, put autosave in your games. Yeah, we used to get by without it, but shit changes, you know? Your mum used to get by without a gastric band, but then the $5 foot long happened. Unlike with the Wii and the 3DS, the Miis aren't central to the user experience. I haven't randomly acquired a bunch via street pass or from inviting people over to play strip WarioWare. So every time Miitopia needed a me to fill an upcoming role, I had to make a new one from scratch. And if you could imagine an arse so tiny that it could only poo out a turd one millimeter thick, like a length of brown dental floss, that is how little I could be asked to do that. So for each one I told it to randomly generate a bunch and I'd just pick one that looked vaguely like a celebrity, and that's the story of how the stalwart adventuring party of me, Moby, Betty Boop and Sinead O'Connor united to battle the evil dark lord Brian De Palma. Crossed fingers and prayer don't make for a good skill ceiling, so to compensate for all the randomness there's the sprinkles mechanic. How this works is, at any point during battle you can pause and then give yourself all your health and magic back. That's it. Kinda of feels like a last minute spackle sort of gameplay mechanic. There is a limit to it, but even so it kinda of makes healing spells and items completely obsolete. At least it creates the one element of Twitch gameplay, when you have to make sure you slam the pause button and sprinkle all your health back before Moby wastes his turn eating a fucking healing banana. Held up against Neo Doom's tightness of design, Necromunda falls short, its various gimmicky mechanics work together like horny cats in a taffy pulling machine, and the layout and visuals aren't clear enough to serve the quick decision making fast paced gameplay demands. Still, put all that aside and embrace the flow of traversal and combat and you might find yourself riding the wave of enjoyment, until you get to the end of a mission and have to deal with the user interface, at which point the wave of enjoyment crashes into a concrete jetty and you get your head stuck in a mooring ring and there's a shark. I reviewed Sniper <laughs> Ghost Warrior 3 and it was god awful, like watching a Jason Bourne film where the costume department accidentally ordered everything two sizes too small, and Jason Bourne spends every action scene in a dustbin growling with generic intensity about how his jockstrap pinches. Sniper <laughs> Ghost Warrior <laughs> Contracts 1 was an improvement that it was a game like reading a slightly interesting magazine in a doctor's waiting room, as opposed to being like the ensuing botched colonoscopy. I covered it in my compilation review of games I couldn't think of many interesting things to say about, but now the sequel's getting its own review. Not because it's 
it's any less mediocre, you understand, but because it's now so mediocre that the mediocrity has come back around to being interesting. It's been a while since I've seen a game so utterly milk toast in all its attributes. The plot, right, is that you're a lone sniper in a nondescript Middle Eastern oil nation with a new government that I guess didn't import enough Simpsons DVDs and therefore the Western powers want ousted. You proceed to oust it by tracking down a bunch of key power brokers and turning all their heads into very short-lived, highly pressurised ornamental fountains. Concluding with the big leader herself. You do all of that, then the very no-nonsense voice in your head says, well done, and you go home. I guess I was expecting a twist. Like the big leader gets in a giant robot suit or some kind of fortified bunker at least that isn't just standing around in a courtyard, looking like she's waiting to complain to the gardener about some neglected Leylandi eyes. Or maybe the very no-nonsense voice in your head could be lying about your targets. You only have his word that they're evil, and the worst you ever see them do is neglect to close the Venetian blinds before you make everyone else in the room forever paranoid of distant shrubbery. So you have to snipe crazy long distances calculating wind drift and bullet drop off. So it's actually rewarding when you score a headshot and it's like watching slow motion footage of a dog overturning their food bowl. But this is a modern stealth game, and so as always, the spectre of Cockup Cascade hangs overhead like a socially inept zeppelin. If you miss your target and set off an alert, then just fucking reload, because if you couldn't cottage cheese their noggin while they were standing around daydreaming about pies, then you definitely won't do it while they're sprinting to the car. And when alerted, all the enemy bodyguards instantly know your position, because I guess they're all experts in trigonometry. Or maybe my mum made me carve my name and address into all my bullets, and they start firing back, and Mr. Fyingly can hit you from a thousand metres. Makes you wonder why I blew all my money on the sniper rifle equivalent of a Porsche 911, if a bunch of rusty AKs that a rogue nation picked up at the CIA's last rummage sale can achieve the same result. The only real highlight, dramatically speaking, is right at the end, spoiler alert, when No Nonsense Voice is giving his final congratulatory monologue and starts getting emotionally needy. Good work, Agent. You have made this area safe for democracy. This ends our contract. But I'd just like to say, you've been a pleasure to work with, and I'd like to buy you a pint someday. I'm sending you my home phone number in case you want to get in touch. No pressure. Any time's fine. It's just, I've been very lonely since the divorce, Agent. He is still there, Agent. Oh, my cat's come into the room, Agent. Do you want to say hello to my cat? Incidentally, speaking of bums, whatever happened to the tradition of Ratchet and Clank games having slightly risque subtitles, like Going Commando or Up Your Arsenal, in the grand DreamWorks movies grabbed by the ghoulies stealth joke for the mums and dads tradition? Suppose we're above that kind of cheeky fun these days, aren't we, Sony? Probably got nixed by someone in marketing whose only experience with comedy is having had it patiently explained to them at a mandatory seminar. I'm trying to think of ways the title Rift Apart could apply to bums, but all the possibilities make me feel uncomfortable. Comfortable. <clears throat> While rewatching this video prior to final upload, it occurred to me that Rift Apart might be intended as a sort of pseudo spoonerism for ripped a fart, which would be a bum joke, and if that was intentional, I hereby retract the preceding complaint about the subtitle not being a bum joke. I repeat, Ratchet and Clank's issues may not presently be for want of bum jokes. We now resume your snarky internet video. See, there's something terribly flimsy about the setting of Ratchet and Clank, which might be because it's 100% pivots around the relationship between a space cat and his fucking Roomba. On the one hand, it's got this grand space opera interplanetary scope, but it also seems so weirdly underpopulated. It's like each planet only has one actual character on it, and 10 million copy-pasted generic locals whose job is to run around screaming every time something explodes. And a lot of the plot feels like one contrived excuse to go to a new planet after another. We need to get a magic crystal. Let's go to the magic crystal planet where they're mined from. Oh no, our magic crystal shattered. Well, we're on the magic crystal planet, couldn't we just get another one? No! Now we must go to the Fixing Things planet and enlist the legendary fixer of things. You switch between playing Ratchet Classic and Girl Ratchet, whose actual name is Rivet, and I tell you that now before I give in to my sudden extremely shameful impulse to refer to her as Snatch It. So that's Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, generally inoffensive but hardly pushing the envelope, more prodding the post-it note really. I apologise for the abject blandness of this take, and also for the lateness of this review. It would have come out sooner if we'd gotten a review code before the release date, but Sony wouldn't give us one when they found out what it was for. They said that, quote, given the tone of that coverage, we'd prefer you secure your own code. From where, Sony? The fucking dumpster outside your office? I don't normally give you these cheeky little glances behind the beef curtains, but I mean, really. I guess we all knew publishers want to dictate the content of reviews, hence those review guides they keep sending us that read like a timid schoolchild asking to please not be kicked in these specific sensitive areas, but I didn't expect them to just come out and admit it. What's your problem with my tone, Sony? You didn't know I'd make the snatch it joke, but for the plot occasionally going in slightly bananas directions that make me think it was a mistake for the game to divide it across two parallel campaigns, because whichever path you're pick, you're gonna miss out on a few bananas plot points that kinda lose something when just being verbally described to you are the bits when generic anime boy and generic anime girl meet up to compare notes. Hi, we just got back from Narnia, where we learned that the monsters are actually made of jam, and all along one of our party members was secretly an artisanal jam maker from the dark side of Mars. Well, I know you're too boring a character to have made up something like that. It is also simultaneously anime as dicks and anime as balls, and I understand that saying that will immediately turn off half the audience and electrify the other half, but it often seems to be going out of its way to hit all the points on the anime checklist 
list and comes out feeling like a terribly generic anime action RPG. When anime waifu number three appeared and my anime schoolboy protagonist introduced her as his childhood friend, I remember literally saying aloud, of course she fucking is, and oh look she's secretly in love with someone. Can I guess who? Is it 90s era David Duchovny? Ooh, good guess, but think slightly blander. Mario Town is split into three districts. First, Mainline Mario, where the core platformers live on increasingly tall tent poles. Secondly, Nostalgia Mario, where Dwell Earth Games banking on emulating older mainline titles. This is where we find New Super Mario, 3D World, and Mario Maker. And lastly, skirting around all of those, we have Whore Mario, the shady down market region where they just make any fucking tat and stick Mario's face on it like a fishnet stocking on a blobfish. Then there's several rounds of mandatory tutorials before we may proceed. Like golf gameplay has gained much nuance in the last 20 years. Choose angle, account for wind, press button, adjust stupid trousers, press button, and again. And then after all that, right before the actual golf starts, the game goes, oh we forgot to mention, all the golf from now on is speed golf. As in you have to play within a timer and sprint to your ball for each shot while all the other players get in the way. Fair enough, be careful what you wish for, some golf is happening now. Fair enough, shouldn't expect a relaxing sedentary experience from something aimed at kids these days, who can't pay attention to a raging house fire unless it's somehow themed around Spongebob fucking square pants. But from the way we get chucked without warning into nine holes of speed golf makes me feel the game is paced like absolute dog shit. Reject Wii Sports dog shit with a general air of half-hearted jank, like it couldn't even be bothered to erase the perspective lines. Anyway, like most East Games monstrous knock follows the adventures of Adol Christian, career adventurer and highly generic anime sword boy, who must be very grateful that his parents didn't give him a middle name that starts with F. In this game he arrives at a new city and is almost immediately thrown in jail basically for being an adventurer, which is fair enough. I mean adventurers are handy when dragons are stealing the children, but absolutely cannot be trusted around pottery. During his escape from imprisonment for crimes against earthenware, Adol Fitzgerald Christian meets a mysterious woman named I drew my girlfriend's D&D character for my college art portfolio, who in classic magical girl tradition grants him the power to transform into himself but with superpowers and poorer outfit coordination. She then enlists him to help defend the city against strange interdimensional invaders alongside five other superpowered conscripts named the Monstrums. Yes I know it sounds wrong, I know it sounds like the plural should be monstra, it's what the game fucking calls them alright. The Monstrums shape the overall plot in that each chapter adult gets to know one of them, add them to his adventuring party and discover their civilian identity. And it never ceases to be hilarious that the game keeps presenting it like we're meant to be surprised because the monstrum disguise basically consists of a change of hairdo, which might make some sense in anime world where there are 90,000 hairdos and three faces for everyone to share, but come the fuck on, oh the sassy matronly party member with big tits is secretly the only other sassy matronly character with big tits. Next you'll be telling me that Prince Adam knows more than he's saying about this He-Man fella. But there are moments that make me wonder, like when everyone in their toupees were nagging me to try Cruelty Squad, whose screenshots on the Steam page immediately made me think, are they taking the piss? It's all clashing colours and PS1 era 3D models with worse animation than the little dudes on a foosball table, and environments that look like someone opened the level editor and then threw their laptop out the window of a speeding bus, and texture work that looks like the brooms from the Sorcerer's Apprentice got set loose in a water damaged gift wrap shop, and an interface that looks like it got molested inside a crowded novelty photo booth at a juggalo convention, complete with a health meter that takes up an entire quarter of the active screen and looks like an untreated hernia. I gave it a try and I can almost guarantee that you too will be confused by the appeal of Cruelty Squad on your first attempt, if you can even decipher the fucking mission select screen, which is like examining a pile of vomit to figure out what specific carrot that orange bit came from, you'll then start the first mission, walk into a room and get immediately shot to death by an enemy who looked at first glance exactly the same as all the non-hostile NPCs you're not supposed to shoot. Then you try again and shoot the enemy who shot you last time, whereupon 15 of his mates pour into the room and juice you like an overripe orange. And this is on top of the game looking like MS Paint Neon Prolapse and the MIDI music that sounds like the soundtrack from a 90s adventure game about being inside the mind of Nick Cave. You'll probably kick it in the head after that and no one would blame you. But if you're anything like me, something will make you go back. And troll games are kind of my jam, like those mods people used to make for Half-Life that replace the textures and sound effects with memes and the voice lines with 15 year olds yelling cuss words way too close to the mic. I love shit like that, it's amateurish and obnoxious to play, but it expresses something that no other form of art does. It's the equivalent of graffiti, an irreverent expression from an unheard voice, defiantly skating on the knife edge of acceptability. Often darkly hilarious, if only metatextually, from the thought that someone made it and uploaded it, and I downloaded it and then wasted an hour on it, that I could have spent reading William Makepeace Thackeray. And the only strategy the developers have ever had for mixing up the formula is to swap out the main characters for new ones who are precisely the fucking same. Hence the great Ace Attorney Adventures, and only recently the officially translated prequel to Ace Attorney starring Phoenix Wright's Japanese ancestor at the dawn of the 20th century. Now why would Phoenix Wright have a Japanese ancestor? Cough. Surely the Phoenix Wright games all take place in America? Cough, cough, droll look to camera. As I believe I've talked about before, my one major ask of a detective puzzle game is that it should make me feel clever, and there are plenty of moments in Ace Attorney that do that, when the accused thief is weirdly okay with our suggestion that we search his pockets for the missing diamond butt plug, and then I remember that he was caught pinching the bums of court officials ten minutes ago, and that we actually need to be searching the bailiff's rectum. But 
as for why I also hate Ace Attorney games- Ooh, I hate them! Part of it's the sameiness. I want to say every fucking defendant in every game inexplicably hides information from you until you can crowbar it out of the mid-trial. Even when the main character's the defendant, actually. And afterwards the same conversation always ensues. I'm so sorry that I lied, protagonist. I expect you want to resign as my lawyer now and leave me to be falsely executed. No, client. I will not resign as your lawyer. Gwer? But why? Because it's a lawyer's job to have faith in their client, and I don't believe lying should carry the death penalty because I'm just that bloody great. Which brings me to the main reason why I hate Ace Attorney games. It's the same reason I hate most visual novels, that they never use ten words where 90,000 billion will do. Getting to the point feels like pulling teeth while you and your dental patient are riding different escalators. I believe we should search the bailiff's rectum. Were? But the bailiff didn't steal the diamond butt plug. Ha ha ha, my learned friend has clearly forgotten who is on trial here, smug smug. Smash hands on desk like a short-tempered DJ who's just seen a cockroach. Not at all. Huh? I submit that it is perfectly possible for the diamond butt plug to be in the bailiff's rectum without them being the one who stole it. Were? But how? Jesus Christ, if they just let me bend the fucker over the witness stand and yank his trousers down, we could all be at lunch by now. So far, so standard. The real selling point of Dreamcatcher is the premise. You're a lady who's moved to a new city from a small town struggling to get by and make new friends, and when you go to sleep at night you go on a roguelite action adventure through labyrinths based on the memories of your life, fighting boss fights against symbolic demons with names like fear and regret and isolation and oh my goodness my hand is reflexively making the wanker gesture. See I was drawn to it from the description saying how the main character has to work on her relationships in the real world to improve her abilities in fantasy battle dreamland, which made me think, ooh sounds like Persona, that shit's my jam. As in jam my dick inside it and make several terrifying babies. What's so fucking hard about the protagonist's life that they need to fight symbolic fantasy battles in the dream world about it. Admittedly I didn't get to the last levels, maybe it turns out she accidentally impaled her sister on a Twix or something, but I'd expect her dreams to get to that point quicker if that were the case. Jesus Christ, what symbolic monsters do you think homeless orphans in Yemen dream about? Trick question, they don't dream about anything because the secessionist terror keeps waking them up. Twelfth minute certainly seems to have a not insignificant amount of money to swan about, with Daisy Ridley money no less. Yes, that hot young starlet best known for her show stopping turns as the posh girl from the new Star Wars, and well anyway, James McAvoy and Willem Dafoe are here too, to crank the star power up even higher. And guess what? If the game hadn't told me that big celebrities did the voices, I wouldn't have been able to fucking tell. So not for the first time I have to ask a video game what on earth the fucking point of hiring that kind of expensive talent was if any jobbing voiceoverer could have achieved the same result. I guess Willem Dafoe's voice has a unique character to it, although in this case he seems to be doing his best Christopher Lloyd impression. But the other two are both putting on American accents and just sound like generic actor persons the casting director could have bundled into a van at literally any Los Angeles bus stop. I mean you only hired them so you could slap their names on the front, why make them talk in an accent that makes them doubly unrecognisable? It's like getting a personalised number plate with a non-obvious meaning. You blew all that money and didn't even gain any status, you've just made the dude behind you squint in confusion at your bumper. This is a very minor point to harp on for so long, Yahtzee, it almost seems like there isn't much to say about the game. Oh look, it's Captain Observant, everyone. He must have been let out early from his job pointing out the spelling mistakes in other people's Reddit posts. But there was still a sense of anti-climax. I won't spoil the last twist, but for the sake of discussion I'll replace it with something roughly equivalent. After you connect the last dot, it turns out that all along the main character was a dog molester, and the only way to escape the time loop is to get the game to go, you know what, let's just wash our hands of this whole affair and pretend it never happened. And in reply I go, well yes, I suppose that would be for the best. Honestly I'm a little bewildered as to how it happened in the first place. I mean why would a dog molester marry a human woman? You'd think they'd want to settle down with a nice homely golden retriever. But I still get this nagging sense that I got the unsatisfying bad ending that leaves things unresolved, and there must be some good ending you can get somehow where you escape the time loop with your wife and she comes to terms with you wanting to bug as spaniels and you live happily ever after in a house that backs onto the local animal shelter, but that wouldn't work because we fucking molest dogs. So I'm left trapped in this confused mental limbo between wanting some closure for the character we've been identifying with all this time and his long-suffering wife and not wanting to encourage the rape of chihuahuas. But I don't know if I'd call 12 minutes good or bad, it's just weird. It's not bland five material either because it at least sparks conversation, even if that conversation is get the fuck away from my labradoodle. No More Heroes 3 opens with a cartoon of a young boy befriending a baby alien and helping them escape back to their home planet with a Miyazaki does E.T. sort of vibe, then the mood swivels on a fucking dime when twenty years later the alien comes back as a frat boy dickweed wanting to mooch off the planet Earth, along with a horde of alien allies that all look like their colour schemes were decided by randomly chucking crayons at a centrifuge, nerd assassin with poor anger management Travis Touchdown is forced to leave his motel room and standard routine of gaming, anime and masturbating enough that his wrist action could power the eastern seaboard, then puts on a flying robot suit to confront the alien aggressors in yet another countdown of ranking battles. So that's like nine genres touched upon and we've barely wanked the surface. 
And if there's a point where the game loads its shopping basket with a few too many slightly tiresome pastries, it's when it's doing the nudge wink self-aware video game bit. Like fairly late in the game one of the bosses insists on fighting you as a turn-based RPG battle, which I admit was pretty funny in the two or three other subversive self-aware comedy games I can think of that did the same gag. Not here, here it falls completely flat by having characters bang on about it for ten minutes. Oh I don't want to do a turn-based battle, fuck, fuck, hey what's going on, why can't I move, what's that menu doing there, masturbate, masturbate, this isn't what serious gamers want, do they kids? Oh boy how self-aware and quirky, don't look away Travis, I'm so close. Meanwhile we defeat one of the other bosses in the game by beating them at musical chairs. Then we fight their cartoon octopus friend who can only say one word and can shoot an instant kill death laser from their mouth. See this is the shit I wanted, Suda51, the constant barrage of weird ideas and hard left turns. Not the smug in-jokes, stream of consciousness not stream of self-satisfied ejaculate. Ah Psychonauts, what a great game that was. I hope your fingers are still smarting from the last time I had to bring that across. Sure the platforming physics were a bit jank and all the characters looked like their concept art had been scanned in by someone with Parkinson's disease, but it was funny and well written and weird because it was a Tim Schafer game from that wonderful golden age of the PS2 era when games could be weird and culty. I said culty, because they weren't expecting to make enough money to pay for the CEO's moon expedition. Unfortunately they were still expected to make some amount of money, and that's where Psychonauts 1 fell short on initial release, and why I had to start breaking fingers. Raz's fellow interns are all disaffected teenage extreme Ghostbusters rejects, and the plot isn't even about them much, they just sort of pop up as a convenient peer group whenever Raz needs someone to get embarrassed in front of. It's almost like they're teenagers in a game being written by people who don't really identify with young people anymore which might also explain why the plot eventually focuses squarely on the original founders of the Psychonauts and Raz having to fix their doddery old Farrah Fawcett liking brains so they can help him defeat their one-time nemesis. So from the halfway point of the plot we suddenly have to stop giving a toss about any established characters and exclusively reserve our tosses for the backstories and inner worlds of these hitherto unexplored vintage scrotes. It's like if most of the second half of The Last Crusade was devoted to a flashback about Indiana Jones's dad. Yes, I'm sure Indiana Jones's dad had a jolly interesting and storied life, but I'm kinda here to watch Indiana Jones biff Nazis and snog hotties. And the closest his dad gets to snogging hotties is adding Tabasco to his Sunday brunch Bloody Mary. My point is, for me, Psychonauts 2 suffers from having lost its cynical edge. Rather than fuck with a mad person's head so he firebombs a hospital, we must now acknowledge the admittedly fucked up ethics of going into someone's brain and rewriting their personality, and then we must all learn an important lesson and apologise and forgive each other and everyone gets extra marshmallows in their cocoa that night. Not that there's anything wrong with that, marshmallows are nice, but I knew the ethics were fucked. I assumed that was the big joke, that they were teaching wholesome apple-cheeked summer camp kids the art of hands-free bottomization, and I struggle to recall parts of Psychonauts 2 that really stand out as comedy highlights, the way stuff like the Milkman Conspiracy did in the first game. The premise is, you are Colt Vaughn, grizzled mercenary type because you can't exactly get a job at the DMV with a name like that, who wakes up with no memories on an island full of good time Charlies who have deliberately locked themselves in a one day time loop so they can party forever and never have to deal with the ever downsliding outside world. And Colt wants to escape from this situation, which is the first glaring plot hole for me, fucking hell. Airdrop in two crates a hard cider and a real doll and show me where to sign, guys. Colt's discovers that the only way to kill the loop is to assassinate the eight superpowered nerds who set it up, none of whom are particularly hard to kill, but the snag is you have to kill them all in a single loop, and they're deliberately avoiding each other, so your quest is to repeat the day until you've figured out the precise sequence of actions that will result in all of them carking it, since they don't remember things from loop to loop and will always keep the same schedule. And that's glaring plot hole number two, because why would these party nerds want to set up a time loop that resets their own memories every loop? Surely from their perspective it would just be a normal day, one that ends with a grizzled mercenary type decanting their brain matter across the fucking twister mat. I found a suppressed machine pistol in loop 1 that could accurately bestow insta-kill headshots at any range, and that thing was my friend for life. I named it Norman. Which is a shame because finding better weapons and improving your capabilities is supposed to be the reason to explore and do side quests, but once I had Norman and the nexus power that makes everyone around your target die as well, possibly thanks to magically induced flatulence, I was pretty much good to go. Would you like to equip this weapon mod that improves your range? What do you think Norman, would you like an extra 10% range on top of infinite? Norman doesn't seem enthusiastic, but that might be the suppressor. But you should know by now that I'm attracted to quirky and Lost in Random has a lot of that very specific Tim Burton-y, American McGee's Alice-y flavour of quirk, where the environment designers have never heard of a straight line, and all the characters look like factory reject plushies made from stitched together discarded fish carcasses. Actually if I were to summarise Lost in Random's theming I'd go for, it's American McGee's Alice if Lewis Carroll's estate sent the Frighteners round and told them they had to take out all the references to Alice in Wonderland, and then another set of Frighteners from Isaac Newton's estate came around and told them it couldn't have any jumping either. Unrewarding, lack of movement options, hard to understand map, bunch of weirdos standing around, what is this, the San Francisco Francisco bus system. So in gameplay terms at least, Lost in Random has gone all in on the combat system. How that works is, you build yourself a deck of cards you've collected, then when you're in the combat arena you use your harmless slingshot weapon to burst a few of the enemy's protruding blackheads until you can gather enough magic pus to draw a few cards, then you roll the dice to get a number of points that you can then spend on activating the cards. So you activate a big twatting stick card to equip yourself with a twatting stick with which to twat the enemy. Yeah I know it sounds like an awful lot of unnecessary steps in the way of twatting things with sticks, but it's having to deal with the random element that adds the extra spice isn't it? Maybe you needed to spend the points on healing the 
this round. Maybe you didn't have enough points for the twatting stick and had to go back to bursting zits for a few minutes or make do with the castigating tube. Maybe you didn't draw a twatting stick card this round so you have to lay down a trap or that one that makes your dice friend explode after nine seconds. Bitch, I don't know where the fuck I'm going to be in nine seconds. I've lost control of my life. Or maybe you'll draw the card that shoots a laser as powerful as a stream of cold piss between you and your dice friend that you might be able to politely ask the enemies to stand in the way of if you're lucky. Or maybe you won't because you didn't put that card in your deck because you're not a fucking dunce. For a modern open world game there's surprisingly little extraneous bullshit. No multiple varieties of meaningless collectibles, no elaborate action set pieces, no equipment system to let you trade out your plus 0.7% licorice damage Legend of Korra costume for a plus 1.2% elbow stamina Legend of Korra costume, identical but for slightly longer turn ups, none of that. Just a rather bare and autumnal upgrade tree and everything wrapped up in two gameplay sessions. It's refreshing at least. Just not the sort of thing you write fan fiction about or aggressively defend in the YouTube comments or video reviews by people who couldn't give two pumps of a second hand flashlight for your opinion. Well, hijack my helicopters. I can't believe there's been six Far Cry games already. Surely the concept of liberating an open world sandbox from a charismatic fuck face by clearing out base after base with a silent sniper rifle and occasionally having to shake a mountain lion off your todger is still as fresh and exciting as a dissipating fart in a locked sauna. So what original new setting is the premise being airdropped into now, Ubisoft? Liberating a chain of remote Scottish islands from charismatic football hooligans? Liberating an Antarctic research station from a charismatic penguin? No, this time you're liberating a tropical island. Um, you mean like in Far Cry 3? And Far Cry 1. No, of course not. You're in the Caribbean for a start. That's slightly more equatorial than the last two tropical islands, probably. And anyway, this time you're liberating the tropical island from a charismatic totalitarian dictator, like the one in Far Cry 4. Look, if you like freshness so much, why don't you piss off to your local Whole Foods and stick your head under the intermittent broccoli misting device? I mean, this game was made by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and did anyone else get a vibe off a of Far Cry vibe? I mean, a vibe off a of Far Cry 5 that the series was feeling kind of done, based on the fact that it was set close to home in the US rather than some comfortably distant hypothetical foreign clime? And not really much else. Oh, unless you count a little thing like it ended with a fucking nuclear apocalypse. And you are a generic ex-military type with ties to the resistance and a mysterious tendency to go on violent rampages as favours for people you've just met. You're planning to get on a refugee boat and escape to America where you will happily live out your days getting blamed for all the nation's problems by chronically obese people in motorised wheelchairs. But moot point because you're going to escape about as surely as the annoying fly in my kitchen when I'm holding the back door wide fucking open. So I'm looking at this boat thinking hang on, this smacks of that joke ending thing the last couple of Far Cries have done where you can make your character to flat out not start the game and piss off home instead. And I was buggered if I was going to play the whole first chapter again so I just meekly went back to the rebels and magically became a die-hard dedicated revolutionary because the premise demanded it. This annoyed me because in previous games, well mainly just three, I enjoyed the way the main character and his motives developed organically over the course of the plot but this feels like they're asking me to do all the work. What do I just invent my own reason for why my dude abandons his escape plan and joins the rebels? Fine, I'm also going to invent that he secretly draws gummy bears porn and has a model 19th century sailboat instead of a cock. Wee! this is fun. There was one car chase plot mission I had to retry like 17 times because I was stuck in the back of a speeding truck with no fucking cover while enemy trucks just freely drove right up and riddled me with lead because I couldn't control where my car went because my driver kept getting distracted by lollipop ladies and the whole mission just felt very carelessly slapped together as far as game design goes. As for whether the overarching story is worth it, well you'd have to ask someone who finished the game. The above mentioned mission was strike one but even after I finally beat it by waiting for a few lucky breaks in a row with the enemy pursuer's AI fucking up and failing to outwit the deceptive cunning of several passing stationary objects, the rest of the game just wasn't keeping my interest alive. Reused setting, none of that interesting magical realism element that Five lent into a lot, where reality keeps breaking down because you're on so many drugs you've forgotten how to tell your arms from your legs and keep picking your nose with your big toe. So sorry but I don't see why I should put the effort in if the game won't. Tug of war with only one player is just some twat holding a rope. Metroid Dread is sadly not a game about space bounty hunter Samus Aran ill-advisedly putting out a vanity reggae album, but a new Metroid game on the Switch that leans a little bit more into the space horror theme that lurks at the bottom of a lot of Metroid games like all the tasty cheesy bits in an ineptly tossed salad. It's also a direct sequel to Metroid Fusion on the GBA, but you kids of today probably won't appreciate that much. GBA? What's that stand for? Grandad's babbling again. No, you little bastards. Game Boy Advance, a significant handheld in the annals of gaming. Look, we don't want to hear any more about what kind of advances you've been making on gay boys, yeah? It's least of all annal related ones. You defeat each what by finding a room with a giant spunk beam of death that can only be used once because it has to turn over and go back to sleep for a while before it's ready for another round. Oh look at Yahtzee seeing sex metaphors everywhere just because the main character's a lady and he's about as woke as a sloth on nitrous oxide. Hey, don't tell me this series has never played up the lady thing. Look at Metroid Other M, or to give it its more accurate title, Babies Other Babies. Even in Metroid Dread the power armour around Samus's thighs has gotten noticeably double C thick, shimmying those childbearing hips back and forth like two basketballs on a swing. Samus must be getting on in years by now, right? Wonder if she has ever 
never thought about settling down and giving birth to something horrifying. Sorry, was I doing a game review? Shit, better review the game then. Sure, on the one hand you have distinct characters like Old Woman and Chunky Bespectacled Doomsday Prepper Man, who was probably very grateful that the zombie apocalypse meant he didn't have to go to his court hearing for joining the January 6th riots, but then you have two variations on Serious Man with Beard, as well as Hot Girl A and Hot Girl B. Characters I can only assume were added to the mix in order to have more cosmetic variants with which to fuel the grind machine. The point is, if Let 4 Dead had any subtlety at all with its giant screaming zombie hordes and big fat dudes with weaponized bulimia, then Back 4 Blood excises it. It's more interested in throwing endless parades of special zombies at you than in building Left 4 Dead's characteristic peaks and troughs where the game would pull out the bum dildo for a few moments to let you get your breath back and appreciate the times when it isn't buggering you senseless. Without that, Back 4 Blood is just a stream of noise and I struggle to remember any standout moments from it. But what are you gonna do, Left 4 Dead fans? Play all the other new Left 4 Dead content that's coming out thick and fast? No. This is the only new Left 4 Dead you're getting and you're stuck with it so you might as well try to smile as the bum dildo slides home. But Yahtzee, you haven't even mentioned the deck building element. Surely there could be nothing more interesting than a deck building element, obliging you to sort and select your cards before you start playing, akin to James Bond not being able to go to his next globetrotting action scene until we spend five minutes watching him decide what underpants to pack. Surely, Yahtzee. 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 Surely. Say something, Yahtzee. Um breasts. Which makes it all the more weird to me that as with Avengers, they refuse to just flat out adapt the fucking movies. They'll use the same aesthetics and the same characters with the same traits if some slight changes to the backstories, but recast them all with their fucking stunt doubles. Oh, I'm sure there's some cunty bureaucratic reason. I'm sure the fact that it's technically a new adaptation means some twat in a suit banked two paychecks this week. But try explaining that to the heartbroken kiddiewinks wanting to know why Star-Lord is no longer lovable, huggable Chris Pratt, but instead some thuggish frat boy cunt with a steam iron for a face and a haircut that makes him look like the result of the unplanned anal pregnancy of both Beavis and Butthead, but if you want my quick estimation of Swery, if say Hideo Kojima was a bag of cheesy watsits, Swery would be a knockoff corner shop own brand corn snack that sells for about 10p a bag, tastes like packing material and clings to your teeth with the resilience of Jean Valjean, but he is an auteur and worth celebrating for that even if he's never let himself be held back by little things like lack of game design competence or original ideas. You can always tell from Swery's new games what TV shows he's been binging lately. With Deadly Premonition 1 and 2 it was Twin Peaks and True Detective respectively, with D4 I think he just took a fistful of mushrooms and stared at untuned static for an hour, and now with the good life he seems to have gotten into Midsummer Murders or something. We're still wondering where the hell it's even going when we unlock the gameplay ability to transform into a cat and a dog, which is never adequately explained or considered worth worrying about by most of the characters. Then, because it wouldn't be a sweary game without the tone lurchingly shifting about like a circus seal driving a school bus, a major character shows up bloodily murdered, and again most of the characters don't consider this worth worrying much about. Indeed, the murder mystery is acknowledged only tokenly as the circus seal oversteers back and forth between government conspiracies, aliens, Arthurian legend, and a large man who shows up after every chapter to scream at you about lobsters. It's a fun idea, and a funny image. It's fun being inside your head, sweary, but every time I'm in here I wonder why the wallpaper's so badly hung and why there's no furniture besides a TV and a piss bucket. How to put this gently, hmm. You can't design games for shit. Too harsh? You have the game design instincts of a circus seal who has recently been in a horrific traffic accident. Time me, I'm going for the nitpick speed record. The interface is confusing, the vital hunger meter is barely noticeable, and there's a percentage under Naomi's face whose purpose I never figured out. Sometimes it went up when I slept or ate, sometimes it didn't, so who fucking knows. The map is crisscrossed with fences and walls that your sheep can't jump over, but you can just get off, turn into a cat, jump over it, turn back, summon your sheep again, and press on, and somehow just giving the sheep a jump button never occurred to anyone. Oh, and some of the walls are too high to jump, but your map will be buggered before it tells you which. Stamina doesn't drain in midair, so your cat can sprint infinitely while bunny hopping. Combat as a dog is as deep as a gnat's twat, you just dodge the enemy attack by moving slightly to the right and then bite them in the bum. I took down a bear this way and it didn't hit me even once, because whenever it attacked it just lunged straight over my tiny impish hitbox. Some quests need to be tracked to progress in them, some don't. Some of them mark the location of relevant NPCs, some don't, and good luck finding any of these wandering fuckers without a police stakeout unit. Oh and there's a fucking limited inventory, but the limit's so big you won't know until fairly late in the game when you're blocked from picking up yet another piece of random bullshit that you don't even know if you fucking need. Give us a low limit that we hit early in the game and then flog as a bag upgrade, sweary. This is all basic fucking stuff. Sherlock Holmes is a character who's been buggered inside and out by public domain, and as many of the works imply, that's exactly how he likes it, but no game developer has buggered him with greater enthusiasm than Frogwares, churning out Holmes adventure games for decades. Not without ambition, it seems, but when they did finally leave the paddling pool of the adventure game niche to dive into the shark-infested sewage treatment plant of open worlds, how strange that they chose to do the Sinking City first, a Lovecraft adaptation, when horror is clearly not their comfort zone the way detective games are. Sinking City 
City was just a detective game where half the witnesses looked like discarded fish finger sandwiches and that only distracted from things at best. But wait, this is pre-Dr. Watson Sherlock Holmes, and how can Holmes work without Watson? The audience needs the everyman perspective to balance out Holmes acting like an intergalactic space computer, running socially inept cunt M.E. Well it turns out the reason why Holmes eventually shacks up with Watson is that in his youth Holmes had an imaginary friend who looked a lot like Watson and was also named John. That's right motherfuckers, it's the new improved intentional creepy Watson. I assumed he just needed someone to go halvesies on the rent, but I suppose we have to crowbar new intrigues in wherever we can. Is this not a bit contrived, Frogwares? Who cares, it's public domain, everything's canon now, bitch! So at the core of things are the detective game elements of wandering around a crime scene waiting for little white dots to appear over bloodstains and footprints like moths with an interest in true crime podcasts, then randomly smashing bits of intel together until a conclusion chips off and hits someone in the eye. Not sure how I feel about how at the end of every case you basically decide for yourself who the culprit is, by reinterpreting all the facts the way you want, and the game doesn't tell you if you picked right or not, which feels stupid because a puzzle should have a right answer and a wrong answer, otherwise you could fill a crossword grid with little drawings of cocks and call it done. We've got to have some fucking combat for when Days Gone tries to steal our lunch money. A very token, very systematic combat that is whatever the opposite of a core mechanic is. You don't randomly get in shootouts in the street, what happens is you walk into a room mysteriously full of random cover and shootable hazards, you roll your eyes massively, and then some random thugs burst in, and the game exhaustively trains you in the process of disorienting them by shooting one or more highly specific things, then running up and doing a highly specific quick time event, and if you get any part of the process wrong you get a highly specific knee in the clever clogs and start again. You focus on one enemy at a time, like you're in a Pac-Man maze full of roaming join the dots puzzles, until they're all down, then you get shot because the game spawned three more of the fuckers behind your back and forgot to tell you or signal their arrival in any way. Also, it's still the war with the best narrative, where the writers weren't trying to frame the side with aircraft carriers and predator drones as the plucky underdogs struggling valiantly against an opponent armed mainly with harsh language and angry livestock. Besides, the lesson, don't be like the Nazis, you stupid fucks, is one that certain audiences still haven't properly internalised in this modern age apparently, so fuck it, all is forgiven, World War II shooters. I mean, there were so many different people and places and levels of technology involved, it's basically just as versatile as setting a shooter in space. Not that I think you should set them in space. Hey, Call of Duty, I said don't do that, no, stop, oh fuck, they set one in space. Fetch the mop. But because you know what else isn't historically accurate? Wolfenstein the New Order. And you know what kicks ass? A disgruntled mule in a crowded bathhouse. And Wolfenstein the New Order. Because in between fighting space Nazis on the moon and cyborg rottweilers with cheese graters for faces, the story actually addressed things like racial tensions within allied nations and the emotional toll that war has upon those who fight it. It also featured characters who fuck. And that's Call of Duty's problem. You don't get a sense that any of its characters fuck, or want to go home, or play snooker, or do anything other than fight the war because they're so bloody patriotic even their genital warts are red, white and blue. When they lock horns with their superiors it's not because they're being forced to kill their fellow man, it's only ever because they disagree on how to kill their fellow man with maximum efficiency. Throughout the arc story our heroes are interrogated and tortured one by one as the Nazis attempt to turn them against each other, which might have been harrowing if all the tension wasn't constantly being flushed straight down the toilet by the narration. Little did those silly Nazis know we were putting on an act and just pretending to betray each other to gather information. Ha ha, stupid crowds, let's all laugh at their little snivelly noses and overly tight uniforms and little goose-stepping adorable buttocks. Fuck where'd that come from? Could have been effective if they'd saved that reveal for a final act twist, just when we think all is lost, but we have zero introspection, remember? So our characters can't even for a moment not be waddling under the weight of the biggest fucking bollocks in the room. Ooh, you want to be very careful about declaring any release of anything to be the definitive version, partly because I think that's a subjective thing. There will be people out there for whom their definitive experience of watching The Crying Game was at three in the morning blitzed out on mescaline with both feet immersed in buckets of wallpaper paste. And as for removing previous versions of the thing from sale, well let me tell you a cautionary fable about a proud little man named George Lucas who decided that no one had any need for any version of the original Star Wars trilogy that didn't have added Looney Tunes sound effects and CG as dated as Sean Connery's relationship advice, and now George Lucas has to sit there and plaster on a smile as the Disney Corporation peels the skin off his life's work and stretches it so thin it would disappoint a Marmite enthusiast. All they've really done is put the textures through an HD filter and updated the lighting engine. And when you do that with boxy turn of the millennium era 3D environments, you end up with a look that I like to call Little Timmy Got Loose on the Custom Level Editor. The retro textures were a match for the janky retro 3D physics and unrefined gameplay design. The characters faces were indistinct enough your brain was willing to give their intended expression the benefit of the doubt. Now you've got the uncanny valley effect that comes from everyone emoting like Thomas the Tank Engine characters. It's like, I can't appreciate the effort you put into applying lipstick to this pig, Rockstar, because now I'm going to feel weird about eating it. And also the lipstick has somehow given the pig dysentery, because even this easy mode remastering has made it explode with crash bugs and graphical glitches like those masks from Halloween 3. You see, San Andreas represented a transitional period when the open world was still young and naive and experimenting with illicit substances. We didn't yet know what people truly wanted from open world gameplay. Did they want an Oblivion style stat system where they could grind away primitive weightlifting minigames to raise their muscle stat for no easily discernible benefit except that your torso will look slightly more chiselled if you wear non-baggy clothes, which you never will? No, it turns out we didn't want that San Andreas, but someone had to conduct the experiment, so thanks anyway. People thought GTA 4 was full of 
unnecessary bollocks. At least taking your fat cousin bowling was always optional. At least it never locked you out of a mission on the critical path because your swimming stat wasn't high enough, so you could only continue in the fucking plot after you'd sat in a fucking pond and wiggled about for half an hour. I finally got hold of an Oculus Quest 2 this week, which I've been particularly intrigued by since I heard it boasted a wireless headset. I'm still a great believer in VR. It gives you headaches and makes weird things happen before your eyes. It's all the fun of severe dehydration without the chapped lips. But one thing I've always thought holds it back is how you need 19 cables and the morning off to get it all set up. And then you've always got cables stuck in your head running down your shoulder killing your immersion. And if your wife walks in while you're nailing VR anime broads and you spin around too quick, you run the risk of hanging yourself and that's a niche sexual thrill at best. I feel like in the course of ZP I've reviewed Resident Evil 4 like nine times with varying degrees of directness. So just to give you the quick summary, third person, shooty shooty, angry Europeans, bad dialogue, campy campy, ooh scary scary, monster fights, village castle island, big tits, jug ears, help, Leon, smuggity smug, dead is he dead. One of my favourite games of its era and I was keen to see how VR would enhance its trademark intense back to the wall poo to the underpants combat. Well first of all it's hard to get immersed from the way the action keeps switching to video player mode to show Leon somersaulting through a window or a quick establishing shot of the area we just entered, but in fairness how are you supposed to translate those to VR? Make the player do a somersault? Let them look at the area themselves with their eyeballs? But then immersion is always difficult in any VR shooter with a focus on two-handed weapons. How's this for a million dollar idea? VR hand controllers that clip together for whenever you switch to a two-handed gun, so you're not having to stand with one hand awkwardly hanging in empty air while the in-game barrel bounces up and down like a public opinion poll in an election debate. Shin Megami Tensei Yahtzee! Uh, sorry, I haven't got any tissues. No, you big racist. You should play the new Shin Megami Tensei 5, since you like Persona games so much. Went to the anime fans every bloody week for the last month. For fuck's sake, you anime fans are like drug dealers, you are. You hang around outside middle schools looking for any kid showing the slightest interest in Pokemon cards, and then refuse to leave them alone till they're gluing fridge magnets to their hair and insisting on being called Sasuke. Shin Megami Tensei is the mainline series of RPGs that Persona spun off from, Yati. As you bloody well know, you constantly Evangelion referencing obvious closet anime liking person. Although I did feel a stir of emotional connection when I first ran out into bad Tokyo and encountered a pixie. It was a much needed pang of familiarity in a strange place. Instantly I knew a long and complicated ladder of disown crafting lay ahead. No doubt we'll see all our old friends, Jack Frost, Neko Shogun, that one that looks hauntingly like a penis, but it always starts with pixie. The first acorn that starts the spreading oak, the first vaccine hesitant parent that starts the downfall of western civilization. But the fact is I don't bring any enthusiasm to JRPGs because I don't generally like samey turn-based battling, so the game has to meet me halfway. That's how my chemistry with Persona games always works. There's enough energy on its part to compensate for my dowdy arse. Shin Megami Tensei just doesn't have that. Our blind date ends with me pushing my peas around my plate as it asks if I've accepted Jesus into my heart. But hey, if you prefer it for its meteor tactical challenge, then good for you. Some people like that. Some people like bringing their guitar to parties and seething with resentment when everyone else would rather play rock band than listen to them strumming out Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd for the 14th fucking time. You know that whole plot the last few games were setting up with Cortana turning into the big baddie? Well that's all in the bin. Halo Infinite starts in the aftermath of course Hana already having been sorted out, as a new and bigger bunch of bastards show up who hate humans more than any previous bastards, wiping out the human forces and leaving Master Chief for dead. They're called The Banished, so let's just add that to the ever-expanding list of Halo entities named the and an ominous word. After Chief gets discovered in space and reactivated for the umpteenth time, he has to go down to a new Halo ring to prevent The Banished from reactivating the auditorium on behalf of the Harbinger because a ta 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 Halo. Sorry, I meant to say, bastards hate humans, kill all the bastards. Thank you. I will. Most Halo vehicles flip over if they drive over anything larger than a chocolate raisin and the terrain is usually about as even as a section of your grandmother's upper thigh served with crinkle cut chips. So to counterbalance all that, Master Chief gets a fucking hook shot. And I fucking love it. It's not as fast or as versatile as say the Just Cause hook shot, probably because it has to haul around the dump truck Master Chief is constantly wearing and all the Mars bars secreted in the glove compartment. But there are very few games that wouldn't be improved by a grappling hook. Losing its civilization wouldn't be so bad if I had the option of a dignified exit. So I was hook shotting up to vantage points to descend upon enemy bases, hook shotting into vehicles to hijack them, and outside the open world, hook shotting my merry way down shiny corridors to avoid wearing out Master Chief's plimsolls, but for some reason the game seems to have mistaken this core traversal mechanic for a gimmicky gadget. You have to unequip the grappling hook to use deployable cover, dodge thrusters or see enemies through walls of vision. So guess what three things I never fucking used. I'm gonna talk about the ending now, so if you don't want spoilers either stop watching or turn on the little windscreen wipers on your face helmet. Not that there's some big spoilable twist where Master Chief dramatically reveals himself to be Tom Selleck. No, I just didn't want to spoil that there is no twist. The game ends with a big fat return to status quo. Master Chief gets a brand new factory reset 
that non-psychotic, soberly dressed Cortana and declares his intention to keep killing all the bastards, leaving me with a profound sense of, wow, 20 years and we've basically gone absolutely fucking nowhere, have we, Halo? The only difference is Master Chief has a new hairy boyfriend. The bearded pilot sidekick is the closest thing to a proper love interest he's ever had. He has to be rescued about as often as Princess Peach, gives him a nice romantic cuddle near the end. I ain't judging. I hope you'll be happy together. I just wonder if you wouldn't get a more reciprocal relationship from slow dancing with the air conditioner. If I sound a bit unenthused in this, the intro to the best, worst and blandest games of 2021, it's because picking the best games of 2021 was like picking my most acoustically satisfying bath time farts. Most years have at least one thing that jumps out and takes me roughly by surprise and reminds me why I'm still doing this bullshit, but I struggle to think of anything that excited me in 2021. No Undertales, no Obra Dins, no Spirit Ferris. Well, there was one thing, but well, we'll get to that. We'll get to it right now as it happens. There was only one game that took me by pleasant surprise as it transitioned from bland hipster navel gazing to psychedelic cosmos spanning rock odyssey direct from the subconsciouses of all four of the Beatles while they were on one of the less harrowing drugs, The Artful Escape that I must sadly relegate to fifth best because this is a top five list of games, not of things where you just hold right and occasionally repeat some notes back to it like you're playing on a Simon machine powered by a very inefficient exercise bike. As always, blandness is the opposite of both good and bad. Like a coin with a yin-yang on one side and a dead blobfish on the other. And that sums up my feelings towards Resident Evil Village pretty well. I don't particularly like or hate it. Some bits were good, the rest was all over the place and full of too many rehashed ideas. Like a dream that I thought was getting sexy for a while, but then I got lost in my old high school and woke up when I realised I was late for the bus. The trouble with these rankings is the lack of nuance. Is it really fair to call 12 minutes the fifth worst game of 2021 if I was somewhat liking it right up until the end? In this case, yes, because that ending undermines everything leading up to it. If you get dragged into an alley by an angry chef and disemboweled with a broken bottle, your subsequent Yelp review probably isn't going to focus on the restaurant's lovely filet mignon. I recently published a video essay arguing that video games may have already peaked at a point between 10 and 20 years ago, and when commenters ask, oh how can you say that, I point to games like Back for Blood and everything else with no greater ambition than to remake shit from the aforespecified era under a rice paper thin disguise at Ubisoft announcing the Prince of Persia and Splinter Cell remakes at basically every indie game looking like it belongs on the PS2, and then I point again and make a sort of mad starey face. Like anyone who dressed up like Robert Smith in the 90s, video gaming must never be allowed to forget its dalliances with trends, and so I felt one of the time loop games from this year should be acknowledged. Death Loop? No. 12 minutes? No, in an even more contentful tone of voice. The Forgotten City then. All the slightly janky uncanny valley skiing holiday fun of a Skyrim quest, except with incredibly solid writing and more than two voice actors. So often games are bad because they're hackneyed or lazy or cynical or end with incest pregnancy drama, so the games that had the best of intentions but are bad because of pure ineptitude are the kind I still prize the most highly. Some games just come out on stage, try to hike up their belts and rip their trousers right off. My second worst game, Werewolf the Apocalypse Earthblood. Just refreshing plain and simple bad game classic with more subtitles than redeeming qualities. This probably won't come as a surprise to anyone who noticed I was kind of reaching for things to complain about in my review, but fine. Psychonauts 2 is just as engaging and imaginative as Psychonauts 1, and is the good kind of sequel that expands upon rather than wallows in its predecessor. It is, however, still a sequel, and I can't be as enthusiastic as I would have been for an original IP, although it might prove my earlier point since it's a sequel to a game from the PS2 era. I'm making the mad starey face again. Guess what? Blandest game of 2021 is a shooter. Double guess what? It's a World War II shooter. Possibly not the one you're thinking of. Because while blandness hangs off of World War II shooters like nipple tassels on your mum when she's working nights, that blandness is thrown into even sharper relief when paired with new technology. Yes, it's Medal of Honor above and beyond. Thanks for coming to join the VR party, World War II shooters. Now leave the wine bottle you brought and piss off. But our worst game of 2021 is a rather unique vintage that combines its mystifyingly bad design choices with an unflinching earnestness that makes it car crash fascinating, like a chorus line dancer with a compound fracture, spraying blood from her exposed shin bone over the front row with every high kick and trying desperately to smile. Yes, it's Balan Thunderpants. This may very well be the sort of thing Swery would make if he took a game design lesson, if it was a lesson given by a slug in a burning dumpster in the middle of a busy road. 
who doesn't know anything about game design. Some indie games are like hamsters on Viagra, doing an awful lot with very little. Case in point, here's everything you do in unpacking. You click on a moving in box and drag and drop all the contents into shelves, cabinets and drawers. Then you go to the next room and do it some more. Pitch that in the elevator at Ubisoft and watch everyone's noses wrinkle, like you just blew a hole through the seat of your pants. A Metroidvania with rather good pixel art, reminiscent of Symphony of the Night, but harder and more visually confusing and with poorer environment design and not as good. Apparently it's a spin-off from some long-running Japanese fantasy franchise, so if you're more familiar with that, maybe the story would feel less like you're viewing it through a sheet of frosted glass. Another Metroidvania, it was alright. Also alright. Yeah, anime. <laughs> uh, I did play that, didn't I? <laughs> <sighs> Fucking sucked. Then the game seems to start fretting that we're not quite invested enough in proceedings and goes, wait, I know what will fix this. Survival crafting elements. Oh, here we fucking go. Because of course, while I was playing Shadow of the Colossus and getting mashed into the dirt by a concrete hoof the size of an above ground swimming pool, I remember thinking, boy, this would be so much more engaging if my dude was also hankering for a sandwich. I hate to bring it up again, but if you go around dressed exactly like Michael Sheen and wearing a Michael Sheen mask, you probably shouldn't complain about being compared to Michael Sheen a lot. Shadow of the Colossus understood that the Colossus fighting was such a strong gameplay element you kind of didn't need anything else, and it's effectively built anticipation by having nothing in between, but riding around empty landscapes looking for the next Colossus with nothing to concern you except saddle sores. Prolapse of the gut seems to have been worried that wouldn't be enough, like a flustered parent hanging around a sleepover, constantly asking if there's enough pizza or if we want more fizzy pop, when we'd much rather they piss off so we can put on the violent splatter movies we snuck in. If you're not familiar with Five Nights at Freddy's, it's this thing where somebody said, hey you know those animatronic animals they used to have at a certain kind of family restaurant that had big terrifying eyes and really unnatural robotic movies? Movements. Those were a bit weird. Hmm, interesting point. Hey, you know that Chuck Berry single, My Dingaling? I think that song was actually about his penis. In contrast to the original FNAFs, which were very low tech games made from pre rendered 2D art and wouldn't have looked out of place haunting a cracked CD ROM jewel case in an EB Games bargain bin circa 1998, Security Bridge is a full on first person stealth pseudo Metroidvania reminiscent of Alien Isolation. If Alien Isolation had fucking sucked prehensile slimy dick. I don't even have to review it, I only started playing it in case my Dying Light 2 code didn't come in, and it did. But when it did, I said to myself, you know what, Techland's new overproduced grindathon can wait its fucking turn. Because Security Breach is very bad and I want to hurt it. And first person stealth horror is game design on fucking easy mode. All you need to do is smash the game over button if the pursuing enemy so much as touches the player. Pac-Man perfected this formula 40 years ago. And Security Breach still fucks it up with a wonderful combination of both extreme bugginess and horrible design. It's not because of bugs that I kept getting surprised by a monster I had no means of locating in a confusing samey labyrinth while hoping to randomly stumble upon five hidden generators, I also had no means of locating, and it wasn't because of bad design that I was then murdered by said monster after being rendered unable to move from clipping into a slide. You're supposed to use security cameras to scout ahead, but with these huge cluttered environments and lack of context, it's like looking for the one placenta on the trolley full of red gelatin desserts. So crossed fingers and prayer tended to have about as reliable results. Either they'd spot me or I'd get blindsided by one of those fast moving security droids that patrol randomly and have the catchment area of a large suburban high school causing Cat Benatar to teleport in, and then running or hiding is pointless because they can run faster, so you might as well smash your head into the nearest pretzel stand and hope dusting yourself with cinnamon sugar will encourage a painless decapitation. And the usual livestream money shot of screaming animatronic face smash cuts are black is scary once, maybe twice if you're trying to balance a valuable porcelain object on your head. Then it's just annoying, and with the inability to skip cutscenes and the restricted save system, this is knocking out square after square on my needless annoyance bingo card. Wait a second, contextual use button you have to hold down for about 9 seconds too long. That's bingo! Here's our fabulous prize, another minute of complaining about Security Breach. Oh Yahtzee, you poisonous intergalactic rectum. Of course it's difficult. You're a tiny child in a jump scare horror game, what did you expect? Dual Uzis and a Maserati MC20? Thing is, massive twat, all this annoyance was only until the game's midpoint. Then I unlocked a laser gun with infinite ammo that stuns animatronics in one hit and instantly they became about as threatening as a great white shark in a gravel pit. After which, the new struggle was figuring out what the chuffing hell the game expected me to do next. Oh, it's coming up on six o'clock, you can go to the main entrance and leave. Feels like there's a lot of the map that hasn't been used yet, but I am so not gonna question this. Got to the exit, the game goes, psych, this is the bad ending, you gotta keep playing to get the rest of the plot, dull the old symphony of the night trick, okay guess I won't leave. Great, we are now permanently disabling saving the game. What? Why the fuck are you doing that? Are you embarrassed about the good ending or something? Are your knickers in shot at one point so now you're gonna discourage me from trying? Well, mission fucking accomplished. To say Security Breach feels unfinished would be too charitable. I don't think they got as far as measuring the door to see if it'd fit. I can only assume that using jump scares to provoke funny reactions from streamers started getting old, and now they're seeing if similar results can be achieved from just annoying the shit out of them. And if that is the case, look at me falling right into the trap. I hope the sweetness of that victory covers up the taste of my dick. 
Okay, Yahtzee, exam time. Please recount as much of the plot of Dying Light 1 as you can remember without looking it up. Uh... Oh, sorry, I thought you said mimic the sound of a cycling refrigerator. When asked if you want to raise health or stamina, always pick stamina. Because stamina is used in combat as well, and when you're close to death, the game has a very itchy finger on the regenerate your last bit of health trigger, so I hardly ever died in battle, and having more maximum health was as helpful as having the biggest scrotum at a pissing contest. Alright, fine, upgrade your combat ability just enough to unlock the two-footed drop kick, which breaks enemy defence as well as their skeletons and the game's entire combat system. Sorry, Dying Light 2, were you using that? See, the reason why I prefer games that focus on doing one thing really well over Jiminy Cockthroat game mechanic stew is that the latter is a whole reliant on many separate pieces, and if you urinate on one carrot it's going to make your dinner guests very hesitant about all the adjoining parsnips as well. The point is, melee combat is a big branch of the game design tree with lots of little twigs coming off it. The game patiently trains you in skillful parrying, perishable melee weapons are offered as a reward for exploring, and the upgrades you can craft for them are one of the motives for endlessly rubbing our face on crates and shelving units, snorting crafting materials up our nostrils. But once I had the two-footed dropkick, which breaks defence in the sense that a cricket bat breaks the defence of an unguarded nose, and kinda makes parrying obsolete as whether or not you drop kicked just before the enemy attack doesn't matter so much when a moment later the enemy in question is hurtling skyward like a Roman soldier in an Asterix book, that's a lot of little branches falling off the tree, and a lot of disappointed sparrows. You can also do missions that liberate sections of the map and then pick which faction takes it over. Obviously there's a lengthy debate to be had over what kind of balance of order and personal freedom is necessary for a healthy society to function, but here's my quick summary of the main points. Never side with the fascists, you fucking twat! In a simmering system soup where no one flavour can be permitted to stand out, the end result is gonna need a fucking nice piece of bread to make up for it, and Dying Light 2's is a little overproved and hardly upper crust. I'll stop trying to sound clever, Yards. Fine, it was covered in spunk! The premise is, you are a generic contemporary gender to be determined Pokemon trainer who I guess fell off the stage in Smash Brothers Brawl or something and wakes up in the olden days of the Pokemon world, when Pokemon training has only just become a thing. The protagonist swiftly astonishes the primitive locals and is hailed as a hero from the sky when they show no fear towards some tiny, adorable, fluffy, helpless baby animals and beans them all in the skull. Silly, yes, but finally a Pokemon game where it kinda makes sense that you seem to be the only trainer who's figured out they can carry more than three or four of the buggers. Soon we get recruited by a quote, surveying organisation who have tasked themselves to quote, survey all the local Pokemon by capturing them and forcing them into either manual labour or gladiatorial combat. You know, the same way Columbus surveyed the Americas, or how one surveys an ant colony with a kettle of boiling water. Then we can just about set sail for Recommendation Harbour. Just one more question. Were you turned off by the way Monster Hunter had decent graphics? Did you think that was a bit showy and vainglorious of it? Well, no fucking worries about that here. Pokemon Legends Arceus looks about as good as one could expect from any game with arse in the title. I know the pursuit of ever higher definitions is the root of all this industry's evil, but Pokemon makes the kind of money that doesn't have to look so bland and full of pop-in, and my character's surprised face shouldn't remind me of the facial animation in Sonic Adventure, where everyone looked like they'd lost a fight with a Cenobite. But in more recent years, FMV games, while still having file sizes that sit atop your solid state drive like an overweight Saint Bernard on an unprepared lap, have gained a certain amount of prestige thanks to games like Her Story and Hurst? Oh, I already mentioned that one. Um, actually, while the plot kicks off with an upset election win by a radical populist party with an agenda that clearly isn't thinking in the long term, headed in part by a blue-collar man of the people type spokesman whose offhand is permanently groping for his next pint of brown ale, the politics swiftly get fairly broad. Some might say a little too broad. Some others might say the satire is so lacking in subtlety it's blotting out the fucking sun. As for whether our choices actually matter in this Choices Matter game, I'd put us at around a 7.5 on the matterometer. Some of the plot hairs have a pretty explosive case of split ends, and there's a princely 14 possible endings. Four 14 endings not for broadcast? Wow, that's the sort of detail that could really drive replay value, isn't it? Well, see ya! What? You're interesting, but you're not 14 rewatches interesting, especially not when the interesting bits are buried under several hours of mid-grade YouTube sketch comedy. I've had a lot of trouble with Elden Ring, but my doctor tells me it's perfectly natural for my age and I should add more fibre to my diet. Very droll, Yards. Now tell us if this fucking game's any good so I can decide if I'm taking this gun out of my mouth. Um, well, yes, it's a From Software Soulsy game and therefore good, and characteristically light on overt storytelling, but this time I told myself I was gonna really concentrate on passing the dialogue and item descriptions and figure this shit out up front. A little later, that vow kind of fell by the wayside because chiefly what I remembered of the prior two hours was getting mashed into farmhouse chutney by a dude that looked like an owl pellet got rogered by a semi-truck. Turns out Elden Ring's hard. Is it, Yarts? Well, hold on while I run cold water over the blisters that searing insight gave me. <laughs> Here's my beginner's gameplay tip. Never heavy attack if you can jump heavy attack, because it's all the damage with none of the wind-up time and stuns anything with poise below ten squillion. If it's in range and not fast enough to hop out of the way, then it's getting cobblestones for breakfast. Not a universal strategy, but it gave me enough edge to counteract the spaz out brigade. And of course, the open world also brings with it horse riding and mounted combat, another thing that's fairly easy to cheese. How can it not be when you can attack and then be two postcodes away before the victim can so much as glimpse your license plate? 
plate number. Elden Thing's open world actually feels like an elevation of the trademark Soulsy spectacular backdrops and droptacular backstabs, and there's a lot more to it that can be discussed in five minutes. Or indeed, played in one week. Sadly, my time with it ended on a sour note. I'd just gotten to this one puzzle boss fight where you can't hurt them till you break their magic shield by finding the three random low-level minions powering it and smacking them around the head with the rolled up newspaper, and it felt like a fucking do the thing three times boss from Super Mario, but whatever. Every FOM software game gets one weird shitty boss, it's in the company charter I think. But then it turned out, oh this was just the first phase and the actual boss fight comes after. And every time that boss killed me, usually quickly because I was still trying to learn their patterns, I had to do that whole fucking first phase again, which wasn't fun or interestingly hard, it was just a slog. I'm here to serve up a sizzling footlong of meaty death to this moony cow, not run around her minions for ten minutes handing out finger sandwiches, and then I ran out of time before I'd beaten it, so it's a shame my last memory of the game had to be two pillowy mouthfuls of buttock. Maybe I'll try to get through the game with my one hour of daily spare time after the kids have gone to bed, so ask me again how I feel about it around the time California slides into the ocean. Or George R. R. Martin puts another book out. Let's face it, Sony, you and I haven't been seeing eye to eye lately. You refused to give us a Ratchet and Clank review code, I called you out on the video, you didn't send us a Horizon Forbidden West code before launch day, I came over and pissed through your cat flap, but I want you to know that I believe maintaining my journalistic integrity is more important than keeping up a petty one-sided feud. I say that to disabuse any notion of bias being attached to the following statement. I hate Horizon Forbidden West and I hate you. Bit confusing, actually. Horizon Forbidden West doesn't feel that much different to the first one, I don't remember getting a hate boner for that. Truth be told, I don't remember very much about it at all. I went back and watched my review of it for a refresher and my past self was actually vaguely positive. Certainly no mention of the main character being a total fucking charisma vacuum, who only ever talks in a breathy monotone, constantly pausing like she's trying to work out a kidney stone. When it transpires that all the shit she did in the last game to save the world didn't actually save it properly and she has to journey to the titular Forbidden West to save it for realsies, she is fucking chomping at the bit to get away from everyone she knows. Oh, but don't you see, it's too dangerous for them. She is the only one who can shoulder the burden of saving the world and it's not like anyone else has an investment in helping her succeed in that goal. What a selfish fucking bit! So far, this quarter's been dropping out heavy hitters like a trapdoor in a domestic violence shelter, but we find ourselves in an in-betweeny sort of week, so let's look at something that might have fallen through the cracks. Or indeed, something that fell out of a crack, and then proceeded to do a lot of crack. I tried out Babylon's Fall, Platinum's new live service hack and slash a thon on PS5, or had a crack at it if you will. Not that it made it easy, first it wouldn't even start without a PS Plus subscription, even though I only wanted to play single player because, you know, humanity. It's like a highway bypass, I understand why it needs to exist but I'd rather not have one in my house. Got past that and Babylon's Fall still wouldn't unbutton its top until I also signed into a Square Enix account. What the fuck possible benefit do you imagine I'd extract from signing up for another fucking account, Square Enix, other than one more excuse to never check my email? Christ, this is like trying to get through airport security with an inflatable novelty suitcase nuke. But eventually I got through it all and when I was on the other side of the metal detector putting my shoes back on and admiring the new tag they'd punched through my ear, I cast a look around and thought to myself, ooh, this looks like shit. So with four attack buttons and a jump and a dodge, we defeat each serving of generic baddies and then in the grand Platinum Games tradition get an award for our performance. And in the grand Yahtzee playing Platinum Games tradition I invariably got stone every fucking time. But in my defence Platinum Games you've thrown an awful lot at me in one go to get my head around, and also it's difficult to time my dodges well when your visuals keep making my eyelids reflexively slam shut. Maybe I'm overly sensitive but I always feel personally attacked by this performance award bullshit. Who are you to judge me, Babylon's Fall? Maybe I'll give you an award after every combat section. Hmm, that was another five of the same dudes I've been fighting for the last hour, and the targeting system continues to be as reliable as a roller skate on the roof of a moving Volkswagen Beetle. I hereby award you the bit of shiny foil that was still stuck to my cream egg after I thought I'd unwrapped it and put it in my mouth. This obviously creates a lot of variance, especially since you basically have to switch everything out for your newest shit after every mission to keep up with the difficulty curve, and that being the case, you'll want to try out your current weapon layout before you go on a mission with it. You'll want to, but you can't. You can't attack outside missions, so if you've, say, equipped one of those magic staffs where after every use your character has to stand there picking sultanas out of their teeth for three seconds before they can dodge the encroaching giant sword the size of a beached whale, then there's no way to know that until you're locked into a mission and fucking stuck with it. As I was in the first boss fight with, go on, have a guess, a tortured fallen knight, hey, petty officer pattern recognitions on the bridge. Fuck you, Babylon's Fall. I only reviewed you because the alternative was Shadow Warrior 3 and that was too short to say much about. How short is it, Yards? Well, put it like this. It was- people often say to me, Yards, are you devilishly handsome sex god who certainly never recycles old gangs he's pretty sure most people would have forgotten by now. Are there any particular upcoming games you're looking forward to? To which I say, bitch, I have to play a new game every week, they all blur together. That's like asking a drowning man if there's any particular lungfuls of oxygen he's looking forward to once he breaks surface. But I just want to say that I appreciate you, Shinji Mikami, for all your years as a positive force for innovation in this ever-stagnating industry. You're one of the good ones. Now what's this new game about? Well, it's an open world stealth action game with collectibles and- OH FOR FUCK'S SAKE! I knew they'd gotten to you too, you pod person hack! Yahtzee, wait! 
I didn't say crafting. There's no crafting in it. Oh well, strike up the band. The usual instrument of my torture has had its anal distension feature deactivated. Halla fucking luya. Hey kids, are you trying to write a comedy game but are worried you don't have the chops? Well worry no more. You don't. But you can fake it till you make it with the patented Borderlands method, a simple three-step process that will turn any dry functional dialogue line into gut-busting hilarity. Step one, say the thing. Step two, keep talking like you're a socially inept partygoer who's just had his first line of coke. Step three, transition into some kind of embarrassed tangent to reflect a level of self-awareness otherwise largely absent from the work. Let's see it in action. Go through that door becomes go through that door because there's probably treasure on the other side. And by treasure I mean more hideous violence against strangers, which is treasure to me. My doctor says I should get out more. Now was that funny or what? No, it wasn't, not in the least. But it does have a sort of comedy vibe about it, and maybe that's all you need. You know, it's comedy in the sense that Owen Wilson is an actor. There's even a whole one gag that I laughed at. Without spoiling, it was the method by which the protagonist crosses the ocean around the end of the second act. And I laughed because of the visuals, not because of anything anybody said. Fucking write that down, Gearbox. I leave it to personal taste whether the self-aware comedic tone ameliorates the dullness of the grind or only worsens it somehow, like a spree killer who apologises first. I felt I needed to clarify my position because people have been telling me I've been going too easy on games lately. Maybe as I've I've come to realise there are better things to waste your energy on than getting angry at things that never change, like cleaning out the shower drains, or harvesting transplantable retinas from the eyeballs of unwanted shelter animals. Or knitting. I've mentioned before I like to go into a game knowing very little about it. That was easy this week, because I can still barely remember the fucking title of Stranger of Paradise. Even now I'm going to have to look that up to double check it wasn't Stranger in Paradise or Stranger to Paradise, lest I earn the wrath of the preposition police. But anyway, the review code came down and I said, ooh, what's this game? And then two hours later I said it again with a different inflection. Ugh, what is this game? Uh, anyway, in the prologue of Final Fantasy 1, the four light warriors travel to a nearby castle to rescue the kidnapped Princess Sarah from the corrupted Knight Garland. And Stranger on Top of Paradise seems to be doing pretty much the same thing until you defeat Garland at the end of the first dungeon, at which point Garland transforms into a girl wearing nothing but a basketball jersey, who explains that she was also on a quest to defeat Chaos but decided Chaos didn't exist and so prayed to Chaos to become Chaos and get defeated, but now she's been defeated so she's failed somehow. And that specifically was the first moment that made me wonder what the fuck this game was drivelling on about. The four light warriors gather in the throne room of a king who looks like he doesn't so much get dressed as upholstered, and he tasks them to purify the four elemental crystals. So they do that, and then come back to the throne room where the same king, who hasn't moved, says, what have you done? The apocalypse is happening! Just off screen. If you don't believe me, ask this mob of angry townsfolk consisting of ten copy pastes of the same dude. Would I be right in assuming that Stranger in the Vicinity of Paradise got cut down a bit during development? I assume it was going to have a full on overworld, with towns you can explore full of NPCs that all drivel out one utterly banal sentence when you press on their heads. And all that got cut because the final game is a linear sequence of combat dungeons and cutscenes that you pick from a fucking menu that they drew a map on so you can pretend it's an overworld. And I guess they'd already written the NPC dialogue because rather than let it go to waste, they stuck a submenu at the bottom of the map screen where you can click a name on a list to get subjected to one of the copy-pasted townsfolk making an insipid observation on the current state of the plot. Very useful feature, if you happen to have breast cancer and will only survive by boring your own tits off. I mean, what do you want me to say besides knob gags? It's a fucking Kirby game. Yeah, I could complain about how it takes itself slightly too seriously for a game where you play a stylized hemorrhoid that could have been designed in five minutes with a pink highlighter and a saucer to draw around, but that's like going to Johnny Pillows for Hands' massage parlour and complaining that I just got batted with pillows for an hour. But it's the first ever fully 3D Kirby game, Yards. Oh fuck off. Look, I'm wearing a sooty puppet. It's the first ever real-time sooty performance in this room. Who cares? That doesn't lend it meaning. Oh my goodness, sooty's hitting you with a tree branch. It's your first ever hand puppet foliage-based bodily assault. Mark the fucking calendar. Well, it's week two of catching up on new trending indie titles while AAA's not kicking off season, or cunt it wank for short. So as well as cowboys and Indians and outlaws and bounty hunters, there are several factions of bizarre fantasy races like witches, werewolves, zombies, sirens and Chinese people. Now one thing that did strike me as odd for an immersive choices matter RPG was the complete lack of character customization. I mean, how am I supposed to play the way I want to play if my protagonist isn't the closest possible facsimile of Mr. Bean? But then my bounty hunter rescued her husband a suspiciously short way into the game and we switched to a completely different protagonist somewhere else in the world, experiencing a completely different plot. In all, there are five story campaigns played in linear order, so I think I get what happened. They couldn't get the character customization to work, so they figured if they just gave you five random protagonists, at least one of them will be marginally more Mr. Bean-like than the others. Oh, you know, I'm just being facetious. At least I hope you do. These last 15 years will have seemed like a bit of a roller coaster otherwise. Spoke a bit too soon last week when I said I was going to stop listening to weebs. 
Obviously, if I was, say, sitting next to a weeb on a long plane flight and happened to let slip that I used to watch Pokemon as a kid, then I'd have no choice but to listen to a weeb continuously for the next four or five hours. And it's because I listened to some weebs this week that I had to go on 13 Sentinels' anus rim. I mean, ages rim. Oh god, I swear you people are trying to make this easy for me now. 13 Sentinels' premise is so blisteringly standard as anime goes, it sounds like a joke. It centers around a bunch of high school students who have to pilot giant robots. And the method they use to summon their giant robots is to hike up their miniskirts and flash their juicy thighs like desperate hitchhikers. Like I said, it sounds like a joke. I haven't even mentioned that there's a talking cat in it, or the part where the teenagers can only pilot their giant robots by stripping completely naked and rubbing themselves on the equipment. Why is that, game? Oh, because clothing might interrupt the cyber neural control interface or something. So why are some of the characters still wearing spectacles and hair ornaments? Oh, who cares? Come and look at this anime teenage girl take all her clothes off, straddle a robot vaulting horse, and arch her back like a cat being stepped on. The story in question is completely fucking barmy. I mean, we start with the nice straightforward opening premise of 13 high school kids who have to pilot giant robots to fight an alien invasion, and within a few hours it's turned out some of them are time travellers from the future, and some of them are time travellers from the past, and some of them are secretly robots, and one of them secretly a man. That's not even getting into the talking cat. Also, you're shown all of the events of the plot essentially in random order, which brings us back to the unique way the story is brought across. How it works is, at first you go through some quick prologue chapters and introductory battles that introduces to all 13 main characters and tutorialises the basics of the combat, and then once that's over with, the game essentially does a great big vomit in your face. Blech. Here's all the character plot lines. Blech. Here's all the combat missions. Blech. Here's the archive library that serves as the corkboard and ball of red string you're gonna need to figure out this load of old bollocks. The story chapters consist of a fairly typical visual novel experience, wandering around a paper puppet theatre, clicking on stuff, until either the dialogue starts repeating itself or we trigger the next plot flag, and generally that flag can be relied upon to make something completely balmy happen, which is part of what kept me interested, because somehow it was always something new and balmier. Oh, I suppose I better deliver these papers to the staff room, tum de dum Oh no, I'm about to be squashed by a giant robot containing my future self with unfeasibly large breasts. Cliffhanger fade to black. But then if we click on that character again, we're back in the staff room, and they're thinking, boy it sure was hard getting away from my big titty adult self. Anyway, about those papers. And now we have to find the other plot flag that can also be triggered in this room. Oh, turns out I can go to the vending machines now, where an assassin from another dimension holds me hostage with a phaser gun. Perhaps this is my opportunity to confess my undying love for him. Eight missions in, I officially stopped caring about the future lady's unfeasibly large breasts and gave up to do something else. See, 13 Sentinels should have realised that the war in the future isn't the interesting part of Terminator 2. The interesting part is when the T-800 finally learns what it is to cry, and then goes fuzzy for a few seconds and turns into a shredded wheat advert from the 90s, although that might just have been in the version I taped. Alright then, what have you just made a game about demolishing buildings? That seems to have been the initial concept of Teardown, which I cunningly deduce from the fact that it's called Teardown, and the very first level requires us to demolish a building, but while there's certainly catharsis in destruction, it's as fleeting as a hastily reached orgasm, especially in the moment after it passes when you have to think about who's going to clean up the mess, and Teardown's physics were frequently giving me the destruction blue balls, because of the aforementioned baby bird neck issue, and even when I did successfully separate a building from the ground, half the time it wouldn't fall over but just drop three inches and stay there, like the upper portion of a wall of Tetris blocks. But to Teardown's credit, it swiftly realises that this is overthinking the issue. If you've created a world where anything goes, the thing to do is simply give us a relatively simple simple task, and then reward us for finding abstract, lateral, or maximally efficient ways of achieving it. You know, like how Scribblenauts would give us an egg and a stove and tell us to make an omelette, and then we'd achieve that by dropping a speedboat onto the kitchen counter from the top of Cthulhu's head. Although since the first game it's taken some influence from, go on, have a guess, uh, Sex in the City? What? No, Dark Souls. It's gone a bit Dark Souls yonners, like 90% of high profile indie games these days. Why the fuck would you say Sex in the City? I don't know, you caught me on the spot. Rogue Legacy 2 is basically just Rogue Legacy 1, but properly this time. 1 had a problem with too much enemy variety right off the bat, and 2 is better at pacing them out across the game. The different areas of the castle actually feel different in terms of layout and navigation, rather than just new wallpaper on the same platforming arrangements. The art is more pleasing, even if projectiles often clash with the background, because random generators aren't any better at aesthetic choices than they are at gameplay balance. So now now we've got a much improved Descendant, we might as well throw its predecessor straight in the bin of memory and move on. Which to be fair, is completely on brand. That's exactly how the game works, in which case I look forward to Rogue Legacy 3, which will also be slightly stronger but also have double vision and distended testicles. It's all in slightly overexposed black and white, it's got a room by room fixed camera setup where every moment could be a frame from a Kurosawa film, and combat's modelled on that samurai movie thing where two dudes make like three lightning fast sword movements and then one of them keels over, gushing red water like a leaky dishwasher in an Italian restaurant. The plot is pretty standard fare, you're a lone samurai with a face like 
a brick wall on a windy hillside, your duty is to protect your village from bandits and inevitably bandits show up. But it's hard to hold it against them, because there are very few who have the sheer infectious lust for life as the evil bandits in a samurai movie. Just listen to them guffawing as you hose down the scenery with the arterial spray of all their friends. They're so determined not to let you ruin their lovely day. Ravenous Devils, which is… okay. You know those light shop stroke restaurant management games usually based around activating timers at different workstations and trying to meet customers' needs before they get annoyed and walk out? Exactly, that thing that there's ten billion of on browser and mobile because it's one of those genres that are weirdly popular with housebound mums who can't afford to pass the time hiring pool cleaners to fuck. Well, but about that Monster Hunter influence, as you explore an area probing its hidden crevices for treasure and progress, you'll find a spot where a hazy stench of body odour and a few discarded Cheetos signals that a mage has been there recently, one of the giant all-powerful nerds that are causing all the trouble around here, and from there we can commence the mage hunt for that area, where we follow the sound of obnoxious snorting laughter and trail of Magic the Gathering cards, until we find the mage in the middle of a scrap between the local mobs who live here and its summoned monsters, get a few hits in to make it teleport somewhere else, then repeat until we can trap them in the one men's rights activist subreddit where it intends to make its last stand, and duff it up in a more traditionally Dark Soulsy enclosed arena boss fight with big health bar pasted over it like it's trying to censor out the skirting board. A while back we were talking about Ravenous Devils, which for all its hideous violence and traumatic facial hair, was still a time management based light restaurant sim, a genre I very firmly file under mum games. Games your mum likes. Those in hidden object games which mums like because it helps them hone the skill of zeroing in on the pornography stash in their teenager's bedroom, but every game can be pigeonholed into belonging to a specific member of the household. Mario for little Bobby, Halo for slightly larger Bobby, Civilization for Grandad, that one DS game about touching underage girls for Weird Uncle Richard. Because there is a story, quite an engaging one, about a small group of characters who are trying to stay human, despite being trapped by hypercapitalist fuckery in their lives as dingleberries on the enthusiastically used bog roll of the corporate structure. A story conveyed almost entirely through radio chatter. All the pieces were in place. All it had to do to get the big tick at the bottom of the page was just have these conversations play out exclusively over gameplay. You were so fucking close, ship shape cake platter, but no. Half the time while a conversation plays out you're locked in a glorified menu screen with your ability to do anything or start a new job disabled until everyone's done talking. You don't even have the option to skip. Christ's sake! I could have pitched three fuel tanks into the processing barge in the time it took for you to explain the concept of unionization, sassy colleague. So close. Pull the lever on the fruit machine, we got a seven, then another seven, then a great big piggy poo. Why is this such a fucking blind spot for video games? You put all this effort into creating lore and audio logs and then you won't let us absorb them unless we let you nail our feet to the ground. Yards, do you worry that as you age you're losing touch with younger gaming demographics? Not at all. True taste never goes out of fashion. Not that you energy drink quaffing screamy Minecraft YouTuber watching little fuckwits would appreciate that. So we did the samurai movie plot in Trek to Yomi in which the protagonist watches their mentor get killed as a child and then trains for years before going flip out spanky wanky all over the baddies responsible and eventually concluding that revenge isn't really worth it. Now let's turn to Sifu and explore instead the martial arts movie plot in which the protagonist watches their mentor get killed as a child and then trains for years before going flip out spanky wanky all over the baddies responsible and eventually concluding that revenge isn't really worth it while not wearing a pointy hat and sometimes even manages to get through the whole process inside a century. Shenmue. So you start out as a fresh faced Disney prince in his school jogging trousers and death by death watch his beard grow and his muscles fill out until by the end he's about 46 and looks like an overgrown ornamental rock garden. It's an interesting storytelling concept, really drives home the main character's obsession if he's willing to waste an entire puberty bringing down one troublesome boss fight, but in practical terms it's not much more than a classic live system with a hard limit. There's a couple of associated gimmicks. As you age your health goes down but your damage goes up, but otherwise you might as well put it out of your mind. I mean on my first attempt I was stressing out, restarting the first level over and over again when I was dying too many times because much the same reason I gave up binge drinking, I didn't want to waste my twenties. But eventually I learned to relax and go with the flow. The flow of being killed. Because it's not a long game and 40, 50 odd lives is more than enough, frankly, and at points you can even spend XP on rolling your age back a few years if it bothers you that much, although that kind of defeats the message as I interpreted it. Ooh, don't waste your precious years on revenge because you'll never get them back. Now would you like to spend some Sifu fun bucks on getting a bunch of your years back? There was one last disappointment in store and that's that there was a bad ending and a good ending, where to get the good ending you have to do the boss fights in an extra hard way that goes against what the game's been teaching you the whole time. You're supposed to duff them up until the icon comes up that says press X to split me open like a naughty coin purse and then not do that. Well geez, pardon me for being prompt. Of course you get the bad ending for killing bosses and the good ending for sparing them because revenge is not the answer, blah de blah, change the fucking record. I'll say this for supermassive games, they are world class experts at creating entire casts of characters that I instantly and completely despise. They should take a side gig making war propaganda. If they made one of these games starring a bunch of Russian military officers I'd join the Ukrainian Defence Force before you can say Pierre Kirillovich Bezikov. A lot of that comes from the animation, there's still an awkwardness about the motion capture faces because of course 
Hall's Haunted Quarry is a synonym for Uncanny Valley. There's something very wrong with everyone's mouths and teeth, like they've been enlarged in post-production or something. The stock sexy girl character in particular looks like she's trying to talk through a bagel that's been hot glued to her face. But the dialogue makes me hate them all too. Everyone's got a bad case of verbally explaining their personalities to each other. Why are you always so upbeat? Why are you always cracking jokes? Those were jokes, were they? Fucking news to me. I couldn't decipher them through your private language of arrogant snorts and constant needlessly abrasive digs at each other. Basically every two-way dialogue choice comes down to be a complete prick or be a partial prick, and even exclusively taking the second option, it still felt like everyone was trying to break the loathsomeness speed record. Okay, I hated you after six words of dialogue, let's see who can beat that. Whoa, hold the phone, the buff jock dude's wearing a backwards baseball cap. He wins, he did it in zero. And like all Supermassive's prior Choose Your Own Adventure books, if the intention is to make me feel like I'm watching a movie, I'd think it was a very poorly edited one. It's always painfully obvious when alternative dialogue has been swapped in, because there'll be an awkward pause and someone's emotional state will mysteriously swivel on a dime. The geography of each scene is very poorly established. Characters have a weird habit of teleporting in and out of the room between cuts, like we fight off a monster and then oh no the monster is attacking Lance Henriksen now and I'm like when the fuck did Lance Henriksen get here? Was I supposed to intuit it from the general air of slightly improved acting talent in the atmosphere? Oh no you're caught in a trap and here comes a weirdo redneck with a knife, quick press the button to throw a rock at their head. No I will not press the button because I think he's coming over to free me from the trap. You don't know that, he's getting closer, better press the button. Honestly I'm a little insulted you assumed I'd be prejudiced against them, just because they look like weirdo rednecks. You know you're just feeding into conservative America's persecution complex. Frankly I'm more prejudiced against that one sexy girl character with the weird mouth, because I worry if I take my eyes off her for one second she's gonna start biting the heads off of baby squirrels. Too late, the redneck's here, last chance. Oh, the timer ran out, what now, game? Uh, uh. Uh, oh, your character got themselves free and ran away. Lucky them. For fuck's sake, why can we never just do what would be sensible? Cause then the game would be over in two minutes, yards. Works for me, the quarry. Walked right into that one, didn't ya? Press X to avoid verbal trap. Oh Yahtzee, you should do Diablo Immortal. It's a bit boring, and the camera zooms in too close, and also it's the most insidious work of evil to ever be squeezed out from the black thorny anus of Bielsa Blizzard. Sounds like you already know how you feel about it, viewers. Why should I make myself miserable all week just to rephrase established general opinion through a lens of dick jokes and progressively changing the title into something irreverent? Tell you what, let's just list off all the things I would have called it right now. Diablo Immortal, Diablo Immoral, Diablo Impoverishing, Diablo Income Statement, Diablo in a Gada de Vida Baby. Now let's move on and try to spread a little much needed positive positivity instead. The unique gameplay mechanic is that you pick up gun cards that you either shoot in that usual boring way of guns, or throw away to use some kind of traversal power unique to that gun. The pistol grants a double jump, the rifle a mid-air dash, the rocket launcher has a grappling hook, which means that if it also dispensed prawn cocktail flavour skips from its hilt then I would officially need nothing else in my life. And I can definitely see the through line at the core of this idea, there's something intrinsically cool, if not terribly environmentally friendly, about throwing spent guns away in the middle of an action scene, like in the lobby scene in the first Matrix film, or that one dude from Overwatch who presumably has more spare guns on him than an American high school lost property department. Why the guns need to be presented as cards I'm a little less clear on, maybe if you could somehow describe yourself as a card battler then you're entitled to a tax break from the government of indie games. And the final ingredient is a visual novel element. <laughs> But Neon White wants to be more speed puzzle game than shooter, and that's fine with me. Would that more of us could be so certain of what they want? Plonk yourself down in my barber's chair and say, Number three buzz cut! And I'm like, Yes, sir! Better than games that come in and go, Oh, I don't know, make half my head short and the other half curly and spray paint the top part green, and the bottom part the colour of your choice so that you have a sense of personal ownership of my haircut. And then I'm like, Bitch, don't come in here with your complete indecisiveness and say it's for my benefit. Don't shove half a pineapple up my piss hole and call it a juice cleanse. Herby derby derby der. Oh, here we go, postal brain damage. Postal is a franchise with some history to it. Basically whenever mainstream media decided Mortal Kombat was the root of all society's evil, there was always a sector of the industry that would passive-aggressively taunt them by making games that were full of all the unjustifiable gratuitous violence the detractors imagined. So the Postal games are slightly janky pseudo-immersive sims that are the video game equivalent of a bumper sticker depicting Calvin doing a naughty wee-wee, stuffed with violence and profanity to the point of total meaninglessness, and then dressed with a bit of pop culture referential humour that aged about as well as Haley Joel Osment suspended in a vat of yoghurt. But in our current age, video games make so much money for Corpo scum, it's no longer politically convenient to scapegoat them, and no amount of doing naughty wee wees on cardboard cutout representations of morality crusaders has the power to shock anyone. Now it's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything. Tee -hee -hee. The greatest experiences in life are had by yourself: a serene walk upon a grassy hillside, a cold drink at the end of a long day, and of course the vile thing you're thinking of that decency prevents me from spelling out. But speaking of ropey cum blasts, for our newest episode of the Zero Punctuation Occasional Guide to Whoops, we don't say that anymore. Moments in gaming history, we turn to the world of solo-developed indie games. 
In August 2008, the president of Mauritania was deposed in a military coup, 11 mountaineers died in the K2 disaster, and then something really tragic happened. Some dude called Robert Poloni released a trailer for the 16-bit style pixel art RPG he claimed to have been working on for the last five years and had just about finished, and the response worldwide was a resounding, okay, literally titled Bob's Game, and looking about as good as one could expect from a game whose lead artist when the project started just about knew how to draw the curtains, the response was generally positive and the trailer clocked 100k views, which these days is worth about half a McDonald's sandwich but was a minor phenomenon in 2008 YouTube dollars. But in the mind of its creator, Bob's Game was so much more than a pixelated distraction any halfway competent RPG maker user could have farted out in a month. Bob's Game was a vision, one to which only one platform could do proper justice and that was a Nintendo handheld, so he eschewed the small publishers that expressed interest and applied for an official Nintendo DS development kit. Now, Nintendo is a big company with a lot on their plate between making Mario pencil cases and removing Princess Peach panty shots from Smash Bros, so they did with Poloni's application what they presumably do with any correspondence from wide-eyed random no-name twats, shunted it to the end of the priority list between trimming Donkey Kong's eyelashes and designing a controller that doesn't suck. And this is where the story of Bob's game takes its whoops we don't say that anymore turn. You might charitably say that Robert Poloni was one of those people who had little time for the world outside his own mind. I might less charitably say he had his head so far up his arse he was getting teabagged by his own gallbladder. And so he declared that until they acknowledged the game he'd sequestered for five years to make, he would publicly protest by sequestering some more. Now with a webcam on him and with the doors locked for a hundred days, this was successful in that it made him famous amid that sector of the internet that loves to encourage weirdos, especially as he posted a series of increasingly deranged blog posts, declaring himself the greatest game designer who ever lived, and accusing Nintendo, multi-billion dollar company and controller of many of gaming's best known IPs, of being jealous of him, penniless suburban twat. Exactly how much one should read into all this is debatable, as after the 30th day of his protest, when he appeared to be lying motionless in a ransacked bedroom, he claimed to both the internet and the nice helpful police officer that broke down his door that it was all pretend. The protest and insane blog posts had been a viral marketing campaign that we'd all fallen for, like the credulous, normal-brained people we were. To which the internet responded with a resounding, Okay. Not long afterwards, Nintendo glanced up from its money sandwich to rattle him off their standard form letter saying, no you can't have a dev kit, obviously, because you're clearly not a professional studio, you're a nutter with a broken desk. But interest in the full release was partially renewed. Shame then that this was the last anyone saw or heard of Bob's Game the RPG until two years later when Bob announced that Bob's Game would be the launch, and as far as anyone knew only title, for a new handheld he had invented. Nothing came of that, apparently manufacturing his own hardware line wasn't the reasonable solution it had seemed like back when he'd been slamming barbiturates on opposite day. So so another two years later he discovered Kickstarter, the eternal promised land of the overhyped vaporware peddling maniac, and successfully campaigned for 10,000 bucks to build a custom van from which he could both finish the game and solve the mystery of the haunted amusement park. The Kickstarter page is still online, and you can go there to read Bob describing his game as quote, a tour de force masterpiece, written by a self-taught genius prophet, and a new religion for the modern world, just in case you were worried the whole van idea sounded uncharacteristically sane. Anyway, the Kickstarter succeeded, whereupon Bob sheepishly announced he was packing the whole thing in, giving the money back before his game accidentally caused the rapture or whatever he was on about. To which the internet responded with a resounding, sorry who's Bob again? Every week for a while now I go to Nick the editor and say, have we got any new review codes worth looking at? And Nick replies, please stop resting your cock on my shoulder. He then adds, here's an idea, have you thought about re-reviewing No Man's Sky? People keep asking you to, now it's been patched into serviceability like a sheep with two robot legs. And I say, what? Go back to a game I've already reviewed? What is this, eyes wide shut? Maybe while I'm at it I should stick a disabled war veteran's prosthetic hand up my arse and use that to type. There's a story campaign that you're doing all this crafting and planet exploring to advance in, sort of like how Subnautica works but procedural, so every time you need to go to a specific character or facility for the plot, the game randomly spawns them on or near the planet you're already on, and says this was here the whole time while coughing and refusing to make eye contact. One might reasonably ask at this point why there needs to be an infinite explorable universe at all if you can get everything done inside one conservatively sized cosmic cul-de-sac, as long as the homeowners association's on board, but I guess it wouldn't be the same without it. I don't particularly want to travel 8 trillion light years to explore a new planet with emerald green rocks rather than chartreuse, but it's nice to know that I could, if I ever get really bored or the lumpy land mammals that hang out near my base start putting up Trump election flags. So after all that, amid the populist community of serviceable crafting survival open world games that all want to selfishly hog your time, No Man's Sky is now officially another one. I think this has proved the viability of this re-reviewing lark, maybe next I could reload my old cyberpunk save and see if they ever figured out how to make my trousers spawn back in. What's this? I cry as I emerge blinking from the wank cellar. A game? An actual new game with some buzz around it and graphics and absolutely no motherfucking deck building? Rise from your graves, industry correspondent! 
correspondence. The drought is over. The sun has risen on a new age of- Oh, I finished it in four hours. Well, that was hardly worth turning off the wank cellar air conditioning. Yes, it's Stray, a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk adventure thingamy bollock with the central selling point that you play as a cutie wooty ickle wickle kitty witty and there's a special dedicated meow button. I think a game where you play as a cat is unprecedented. Non-anthropomorphic cat, I hasten to add, before you blinks the time sweeper loyalists come hassle my bollock sockets. Yarts, what are you on about? Why would a cat game have RPG elements? You're picturing yourself holding the hilt of the buster sword between your adorable toe beans. Thank you for lurching clumsily in the general direction of my next point, viewer. See, when the game does open up into Fetch Quest Town and fight the oppressive regime on sea, I get a sense that our status as a cat is becoming more and more incongruous with where the story's trying to take us. I don't know what these friendly robots are seeing when they flag me down and ask me to collect three cans of Red Bull, but apparently it isn't a fucking cat, with no opposable thumbs and a blank look on its face. Reminds me of that time I got home from wisdom tooth surgery and was found crying in the garden because the squirrels wouldn't bum me a cigarette. So it's a first person game where in each level you're plonked in front of a building or vehicle of increasing size and complexity that appears to have been at ground zero of a volcanic eruption, we've got a high pressure water spray and we can only move on when the true colours shine brightly anew and we've cleaned off all the dirt, played in an interesting historical cameo by the population of Pompeii. Well we don't actually have to clean off all the dirt, once you've got about 99% off an individual component the game goes ping, fuck it, that'll do, move on to the next bit. But there's a big difference between 1% of a small thing and 1% of a big thing. 1% of say a wing mirror is like two pixels of dirt you can't see, so you have to spray a perfectly clean looking thing over and over like it's a black man in the 60s who wants human rights. Meanwhile, if you're doing a giant wall or a patio, it'll usually ping when you've still got a few square feet left. And that just gives me dad game blue balls. I was really gonna relish the last bit, I was gonna cut it into funny shapes. You know, like when you finally decide to shave off your whole beard and take a moment to playfully see how you look with a Hitler moustache. The messaging aside, I describe endings endling I mean endlings ending as unsatisfying. Intentionally so, but nonetheless, the final takeaway was that all the work I put in to get through the game didn't matter for shit, because everything was fucked from the start. Yeah, thanks, I know. Every morning I wake up, realise I'm still alive, and think, well that's put me in a bad mood for the day. I usually focus on games with a bit of buzz around them, but sometimes like a room believed to contain an angry wasp, it's the lack of a buzz that can make me slightly more attentive, as was the case with this week's subject, Hell Pie. I'd heard nothing about it before it popped up on Steam last week, and very little subsequent discussion in the wider realms, and I wondered why that should be. It's not the sort of thing that usually falls into the background noise of Steam indie releases, in that it's not a survival crafter, an RPG maker game, or a visual novel about being an anthropomorphic vixen with a penis, who's also Hitler. No, it's a 3D collectathon platform in your classic N64 era Banjo Kazooie sort of mould, with the kind of visual variety and interesting, easy to learn, hard to master platforming mechanics that requires actual fucking effort to make, and it hits all the right notes that made a hat in time stand out so well, so why hasn't it come up in general discourse? And then I played it for a bit and thought, oh, you know what it might be? It might be because it's completely fucking disgusting, and no one's talking about it for the same reason people don't sit at the bar of a tapas restaurant talking about how their menstrual flow has been unusually gelatinous this month. But if it's good enough for Spider-Man, it's good enough for this tosh, and the swinging in itself is a strong enough core mechanic to sustain the game. The physics are responsive and cathartic, and it has that Mario-style nuance, where a casual player can get from one platform to the next efficiently enough, but a skilled player can bend the environment over a pommel horse and turn its buttocks the colour of a workplace shooting massacre. Although you might not want to if you catch the environment on a bad day. Sometimes they're tarted up in interesting tropical islands or posh restaurants, but sometimes they show up to work with sweatpants and greasy hair and you get stuff like the fucking sewer level, or the entire third hub world, jungle. Not jolly jungle or gelatinous jungle, just jungle, that's literally all it says on the plaque over the door. I'm sorry to have to side with your primary school homeroom teacher on this one, hell pie, but poo references just aren't big or clever, and I have no idea who this game is even aimed at. Little boys whose idea of intellectual discourse is to compete to see who can yell fanny flaps the loudest in a crowded assembly, and of those, the subset that also wants to see small adorable baby animals being bloodily and painfully tortured for no particular reason every time you get a horn upgrade. All I can pick is that one kid I knew in middle school who mysteriously stopped coming to school around the time his sister showed up with burn scars and an eye patch. There was a moment when I was in Jungle, hanging around a bunch of anthropomorphic mushroom characters and thinking, well this isn't particularly obscene, until I noticed that the scavenger hunt item I was looking for was a quantity of white liquid strongly implied to be jizz, and I realised, oh for fuck's sake, they're supposed to be cocks, aren't they? Oh, jizz jungle. That would have worked. I found it was very easy to get bogged down with the micromanagey chores in the base, because something always pops up if you hang around for too long. It's like being a kindergarten teacher. Miss, could you harvest the pumpkins? Miss, Penelope died of old age and the corpse is making us all sick and we still haven't figured out how holes in the ground work. Miss, Lionel blasphemed against our dark saviour. Could you sacrifice him for his impudence? I would, but I can only interact with cultists by standing next to them and pressing the contextual button. And Lionel is currently standing in the same spot as three other dudes, and one of my base facilities, and I don't want to accidentally 
murder the septic tank. Although I did feel the pace dropping in the back half of the game when I hadn't even gotten to the fourth dungeon and I was already nearing the ends of the upgrade trees. It made me wonder why I was still bothering with half the game's systems when the upgrades were rolling in faster than I could spend them, and there wasn't much left to buy except more decorative elements I couldn't be asked to build, because my cultists remained perfectly happy as long as I flung one of their elderly into the void every few days to spare myself the cost of digging a grave. And I didn't see the point in that fishing minigame at all by that point. Maybe it was to drive the comparison to Animal Crossing after Tom Nook decides to finally drop the mask and sell you a crafting blueprint for a Scientology test centre. Who's this craven misery guts going around saying there's a release drought on? In AAA, maybe? All the big money industry's given us lately is Annapurna's smash hit bumhole licking simulator, and that one Smash Brothers knockoff where Shaggy from Scooby Doo beats up the Muppet Babies or whatever. In a utopian fashion obsessed future city, we play a sort of gender swapped Grace Jones who is a cop on patrol for fashion crimes, with a dye gun for adding life to drab business suits and a sewing needle gun that somehow only targets baggy trousers and not eyeballs. And I know what you're gonna say, Yahtzee, you are a warm hunk of red hot animal charisma and I need you slamming up against my love crevices pronto. But before you do that, isn't this mechanically just your standard FPS with non-violent language pasted on? So last week, Volition burst into the room and cried, Hey everyone, we've made a new sandbox crime game called Saints Row, in which you play a thug battling to become top of the heap in a city split between various criminal gangs. And we know it sounds like we're ripping off Grand Theft Auto, but this is our own spin on the formula with a tongue very firmly in cheek. And then we all looked confused for a second and said, Volition, what are you talking about? You released Saints Row 16 years ago. There have been three sequels since then, two and four were right bangers. What? Are you feeling alright, Volition? We haven't heard from you since you released Agents of Mayhem and went into that weird coma. Agents of what? Are you telling me I've somehow forgotten 16 years of my life? That doesn't seem likely. What with Senator Obama's intention to revitalise the American healthcare system? What happened in these three sequels, anyway? Oh, well the last one was about being the president fighting alien invaders in a giant computer simulation. Well now I know you're taking the piss. I hate to say I told you so constantly, with an air of smugness and perverse relish, but I called this when Saints Row 4 came out. It was, to reiterate, a banger. The series went from generic crime sandbox to being the president of space and it was fun and audacious, but it was also going to kill the series stone dead, because there was absolutely no topping it. You couldn't make a fourth sequel about becoming president of twice as much space, so apparently Volition didn't even bother to try and have instead nestled their face between the cosy cheeks of Reboot, and Saints Row going back to relatively grounded crime sandbox after nine years feels like Jim Morrison coming back to life, crashing on my sofa and leaving skid marks on the guest towels. Still, I found some reasons to be optimistic early on. The character creator has finally brought back the gender slider and the customizable socks. But then again, where's my fucking Cockney accent option, Volition? Christ, we can never just have everything, can we? The McRib finally comes back and the ice cream machine promptly breaks down. There's a wealth of side quests tied to the district takeover mechanic. You build specific facilities as your headquarters in each region and each one has a unique side activity. And the custom nature of it sometimes has amusing results, like the one time I was tasked to return a specific vehicle, which it turned out was parked about 10 yards down the street. The game mandates you finish a certain amount of side content to unlock the full critical path, which all sandbox games should do, because making side content but not obliging the player to engage with it is like donating a Turner Seascape to a hospital for the blind. It's not a new spin on the format at all, it's just the same format again, copy-pasted with painful obviousness. In times such as these, when popular game design is stagnating, there's a lot of mileage in recreating old gameplay styles, with a few added innovations from newer times that mesh well with the format, hence the recent wave of retro boomer shooters and why about 60% of them have a grappling hook. But that's not what this is. This isn't a nostalgic callback to sandbox games from 16 years ago, it just is a sandbox game from 16 years ago. And I can't shake the feeling that Volition have just hacked out an inferior clone of one of their old workhorses after rather cynically waiting the bare minimum amount of time necessary to be able to call it fresh with a straight face. And I know cynicism when I see it, just as an ant is extremely familiar with the contours of another ant's bum, what am I on about? First thing we do in the Mortuary Assistant is learn how to assist a mortician, funnily enough. Well I say assist, it's more like do all the bloody work while they sit around playing doodle jump. You're trained in the lengthy checklist of tasks required to embalm a body and then right after the contract signed and your first night shift starts and you can no longer get the refund on your hilarious crack open a cold one with the boys t-shirt, the mortician rings up and goes, oh by the way, one of the bodies is possessed by a demon and they'll kill you if you don't do all this extra stuff I didn't mention. Bye! Don't call back, my phone will be off because I'm at my support group for people who are absolutely bloody useless. The game is at its most unnerving when it's fucking with you in subtle ways. The faces at the windows, the flickering lights, the sound of distant laughter, the salty whiff of poorly held in urine, oh sorry that one was me, but every now and again it throws out one of its unsubtle hauntings like the ceiling flies away and suddenly you're in a phantasmal corridor full of hanging bodies that look like you. And my first reaction to those is always, oh what a relief, which I doubt was the intended effect, because it's releasing all the tension the subtle effect's been building up, isn't it? Glimpse a face in the dark and there's still ambiguity. Was that Sadako from the ring? Am I being fucked with? Then suddenly she's sitting on your chest trying to tuck your nose hairs under your eyelids and you're like, yep, I'm being fucked with. Well go on then, Yards, compare Soul Hackers 2 to Persona 5. Since Persona 5 is the only anime JRPG that hasn't made you want to vomit lace doilies into its grotesquely oversized eye sockets and Soul Hackers 2 also happens to be an anime JRPG that's also published by Atlas and also prominently features hanging out with party members to increase your friendship level with them alongside the requisite dungeon crawling and 
that's also a spin-off from the Shin Megami Tensei franchise, and that also has turn-based combat based around fighting the exact same roster of demons that every SMT game has, as well as recruiting them to use their power and merging them into new demons, and also because it prominently features dungeons based on the internal psyches of some of the characters, and specifically subway tunnels for some reason, and also because you can literally dress up the main characters as characters from Persona 5. Christ, you're predictable sometimes! Also, I like trying to collect all the demons when I'm in a dungeon. It's the best way to be fully equipped going forward, and it's a nice contemplative task, like doing the hoovering. And in other SMT games, this is pretty straightforward. You meet demons in battle, you try to recruit them by asking nicely or giving them cash, to the absolute disbelief of the Pokemon trainer just off screen. You don't do that in Soul Hackers. Instead, you hope to randomly run into one of your demon mates in the dungeon, and hope they randomly want to give you a new demon instead of a sweet wrapper or some bogeys they found, and then you hope they randomly give you one you haven't got yet. That's too much randomness for me. I end up jogging back and forth across a fully explored dungeon hoping demon pickups will appear, which I guess could be more annoying if it wasn't easy to avoid fighting by bitch slapping the random encounters and telling them I'm not in the mood, but there was nothing wrong with the established recruit demons during battle method, and this feels like being different for difference's sake, like they're trying to avoid being accused of copying their homework. Soul Hackers 2 then. Boring, don't recommend. Hope that summary saved you some time, because that's a courtesy the game won't extend. I wish Atlas would stop fannying about and announce Persona 6. Hey, we're announcing sometime soon. Is it Persona 6, Atlas? Could be. Better watch and find out. Then they just announced they're re-releasing the Persona 4 colouring book or something. Fuck you, Atlas. You keep doing this. If I wanted tease and denial action, I'd squat over an automated lawn sprinkler. So you've got your absolutely stellar core gameplay loop, but slightly anemic campaign. Anything else? Well, there's extra challenges that unlock after every level that you can do to unlock a few gameplay buffs that are mostly so inconsequential in their effect, I'm not entirely convinced they're not a Dumbo's magic feather situation. Boy, that slight boost in the combo increase rate really made a difference, Metal Hellsinger. Ah, don't you realise, Yahtzee? There was no slight boost. The combo increase rate was inside you all along. I was being sarcastic, Metal Hellsinger. At first it pulls a sneaky one by letting us think we're doing more of the same shit from the Splatoon 2 campaign. No one thought to put a bike lock on the giant electric eel that powers the city, so someone's nicked it again. And again, the evil octopus gang seem to be behind it. We go through a few little enclosed levels to complete shooting challenges and traversal puzzles, and rescue a little blob friend from a milking machine probably best not dwelled upon. But a few levels and one familiar boss fight in, the game goes, ha ha, you think we're just going through the motions, don't you? Well, you know what else is a motion? Downwards. And then the fucking floor collapses, and we fall into a secret oceanic hub world, where we must explore a series of islands to get to the bottom of a sinister plan to take the world back from the cephalopods and return it to the mammals, asserting the superiority of furriness and lactation. Is this all getting alarmingly nipple-focused, or am I projecting again? And right out of the gate, the wishy-washiness is on full display, because while the game specifically addresses that weird Monkey Island 2 ending, it also establishes the events of every subsequent game as canon as well, it's just none of it seems to have mattered much. In fact, very little matters much. Guybrush Threepwood, inept wannabe pirate hero whose funny name has a story behind it that will unfailingly kill the conversation at any dinner party on God's Green Earth, arrives back on Melee Island from the first game with a vague notion to resolve the series running gag that we never established what the secret of Monkey Island actually was, and nobody he meets gives a shit. Also, his arch nemesis LeChuck, the evil ghost demon pirate and terror of the Caribbean, is docked at the island to take on supplies and crew, and no one seems to give much of a shit about that either. Even though in context, this should be like if Megatron pulled up to the McDonald's drive through window and asked if they were still doing 50 cent ice creams. But then, after the return to and from Monkey Island, suddenly this whole second half of the game shows up, with multiple new islands to visit, and there's intrigues and new villains and stuff happening, and the needle on the buttock meter jumps back up again. Sadly, the puzzle design for most of this can't muster more than 0.4 of a buttock at most. I don't know what the fuck happened between the mid-90s and now that made all new adventure games allergic to intricate puzzle design, but let's make a direct comparison. In Monkey Island 2, you have to win a spitting contest at one point. To do this, you have to figure out to buy the blue and yellow drinks at the bar, combine them to make a green drink that makes your spit thick, blow a foghorn to distract the crowd so you can move the flags back a bit, then only spit when you see someone's scarf blowing in the wind. Then you write into Amiga Power and thank them very much for publishing a walkthrough. In contrast, in Return to Monkey Island you have to win an eating contest. You put hot pepper on your opponent's meal. And that's it. And this was on the harder puzzle setting. Fuck knows what Easy's like. They probably put the hot pepper on themselves while giving you a hand shandy. The sheer amount of unnecessary effort is what makes it impressive. And there are other reasons for it, to simultaneously evoke and enhance the classic Boomer Shooter retro look, and as I said in my Doom retrospective review, those crunchy pixeled sprite enemies make for a greater expedience because it's a lot easier to distinguish them from the background environment. In contrast to the murky waiting for indistinct bits of distant chest high wall to return fire, as seen in the Gears of Wars of the world. What? Sprite enemies aren't murky and indistinct? No, Proteus, and oh no! Oh, I'm so sorry! No, uh, 
I wasn't implying that was a bad thing, Proteus. I was just saying, we better do as best we can to make them as murky and indistinct as possible anyway. And all with the same colour scheme. Phew, now we're real game designers. But horror is a complicated spectrum. There is the horror that comes of direct threats to your safety, the horror of lurking implications beneath a relatively peaceful context, and then there is the horror you feel when you find your mum's used tampon in the waste paper basket, or when you sit on a recently used toilet and feel another person's bottom warmth. That's the school of horror in which today's subject, Scorn, exclusively operates. To paraphrase George Orwell, if you want a vision of Scorn, imagine a bottom squashing down on a pre-warmed toilet seat forever. There's plenty of violence and blood and guts, but it feels less about creating threats and scares and more about putting you off your beetroot sandwich. And as for context, I'd welcome some. Scorn is what happens when the design document for your game is just a picture of H.R. Geiger and then a lot of arrows pointing at it. It's a first-person adventure set in an alien world very heavily inspired by Geiger's characteristic style, i.e. biomechanical penises and vaginas as far as the eye can see, and we play a dude with no mouth. Maybe we're a prisoner of an ironic hell for people who really like oral sex. Or maybe you're a lost visitor to a strange long-forgotten realm from the darkest nightmares of a chained god. Or maybe you're the fucking night janitor at the Serbian dildo factory, who knows? I've got kids now. Yeah, that makes you feel old. Yeah, you are put into a constant state of stupefaction by the existence of entropy, can we please stop banging on about it? Didn't you once say you'd rather go at your joy department with cheese wire and a sewing machine than have kids, yet? Well, people change. Having a kid changes you. It did something to my brain. I've started seeing babies as cute, rather than overgrown tardigrades with money vacuums on one end and McDonald's chocolate milkshake dispensers on the other. I can't even enjoy dead baby jokes anymore because inevitably I picture my own baby and the imagined grief ultimately outweighs getting to sleep in again. I tell you all of this to add a necessary context to the following statement. The little boy in the Plague Tale games is a shit bag and I hope he dies. Every time the camera lingers on his glimmering uncomprehending eyes like the light reflected off two buckets of stale cum, I want to grab his jug ears and twist until his neck cracks like the many party poppers I will subsequently employ. That should immediately bring across the root of my main issue with A Plague Tale Requiem. No dry heave anymore, it's a franchise now. That the protagonist's sole driving motivation is to appease a little cock goblin that any sane person would yeet out the back of the donkey cart at the first bend of a rocky mountain path. Early on, she and the fam take Hugo to a doctor who is very blatantly coded as a villain, arrogant, dis dismissive looks like Ming the Merciless, and all the time he's on screen I'm nodding along to everything he says. We must isolate the boy and treat him according to current scientific understanding. Yes, great idea, thank Christ Captain Sensible finally arrived. But then he does a medical thing that makes Hugo say ow, and Amicia hears and decides she must get Hugo away from this unfeeling monster. This is part of a whole chapter where Amicia is sent out to get some herbs, which illustrates that Amicia can't even pop down the chemists without getting caught in an apocalyptic battle for survival. And then she gets back, holding up the medicine, covered in blood and re-traumatised for the umpteenth time, and her mum goes, what? took you so long, and it feels like something from Postal 2. We must ignore Doctor's orders and take Hugo to the island he's been dreaming about, which I know exists and will help him, because question mark. Now we're on the island, we must follow in the footsteps of a previous historical playground whisperer, because question mark. My pet canned apocalypse deserves a happy life, because question mark. I have not power bombed him down a concrete stairwell, because question mark. So what else should we call games where you repeatedly grind up infinite amounts of copy-pasted random combat in order to acquire 19 different currencies, with which to construct new equipment colour-coded for alleged rarity, that are basically identical to every other but have higher numbers to compensate for ever-increasing enemy damage sponginess. Hmm, let me think. How about cunts? Games made by cunts. Evil money-grubbing cunts who make overpriced emotion-deadening culturally bankrupt Skinner boxes deliberately designed to foster addictive behaviour, who don't even feed their dog until they've run long enough on a treadmill generator to offset the cost for a bag of Yukonuba. That kind of cunt. Demonetize me, YouTube, I don't care, and neither does my editor. Probably. But Mothy Tights meets the challenge posed by the Arkham vs High Standard like a recent British Prime Minister by instantly caving and giving the fuck up. Push all comparison to the Arkham games out of your head, okay? They are on another fucking plane of existence. They are yucking it up on the Elysian fields right now, and we're in Tartarus's deepest, darkest shit pit. Here's a better comparison. Bottom Shites is the DC Universe's answer to Marvel's Avengers. Yeah, might as well end the review right there, hey. I mean, I already used up Bottom Shites. Anyway, you do these random copy-pasted crimes in order to acquire clue dollars that are spent to unlock larger random copy basic crimes that entail much the same shit but with bigger rewards, then you go into a story mission where you do even more of the same shit except instead of randomly copy-pasted stealth combat arenas, it's stealth combat arenas that merely feel randomly copy-pasted, and even when it does begrudge you a boss fight or a puzzle, I guess the bottom line of this whole review is that the game has absolutely no substance. There's no life to any part of it, no personality. The dialogue's awful. Your average between mission cutscene has our four protagonists standing around in their flat chair looking like a fucking screen test for the original cast of Saved by the Bell. One of them says something obvious, there's a long pause as a room full of 60 over paid writers argue over the next line, and then someone says another obvious thing. It's villains that make Batman media come alive, and hardly any of the fuckers bother to show up. Remember when you went to Penguin's nightclub in Arkham City and the Penguin captures you and there's like a whole bunch of fights and interesting rooms to explore and a big shark? That was a fucking party. You go to Penguin's nightclub in Scrotum Blights, you go through one room of generic baddies, and then Penguin tells you to piss off. And you do. 
you literally piss off because he said to. And go back to random copy-pasted crimes. Arkham as Batman would never meekly leave because the Penguin told him to piss off. Fucking Adam West's Batman wouldn't. Not before holding out the bat swear jar. As it relies less on extracting maximum mileage from falling down and going bois. And has given the rabbits actual dialogue and voices so wit can be on display. I enjoyed how the returning AI support character and the AI that runs the ship kept getting catty with each other. I appreciated how one of the new main characters is a sort of rabid version of a generic broody anime character with a sword and stupid neon hair whose name is literally Edge. It offers a bite of satire that I'd be feeling pretty attacked by if I were one of like nine different Sonic the Hedgehog characters. So I enjoyed the generally cleverer tone, I just worry it would be lost on the rabbit's target audience. Why are you making caustic satirical jokes about this one rabbit character's singing career? When is she going to fall down and go boire? Please hurry up so I can stick these crayons up my nose and get back to campaigning for state governor. We return for hopefully the final cocking instalment to the adventures of Bayonetta, the ass-kicking witch lady with such weird bodily proportions that if you nailed her to a wall you'd think she was a map of the Toronto Public Transport system, with an all new voice actor and all the same everything else. Suppose we better address the leather clad giraffe in the room, apparently there was a flap with the original voice actor either being paid too much or not enough and then turning out to be a bit of a drama farmer who stepped on a puppy once or something like that. I don't really pay attention to behind the scenes shit, I do know they got Jennifer Hale in to replace her, who's like the voice actor equivalent of, I don't know, carpet. Nothing wrong with carpet, our lives are better with carpet in it, it's just that it's absolutely bloody everywhere and hard to get excited about, especially if someone stepped on a puppy on it. And this particular carpet seems to be having trouble pinning its British accent down. It keeps escaping and going on a complete tour of the southeast before being recaptured. I find it very hard to grasp precisely how much threat Bayonetta is under at any given moment because she just keeps pulling new superpowers out of her weirdly proportioned bum until she wins. The final boss encounter in this game goes through the same cycle like nine times. Ten print, haha, give up, you cannot beat me. Twenty, Bayonetta stomps him like a poo in a shower drain. 30 print, oh no, you have beaten me, how is this possible? Psych, slightly more invincible form. Bayonet almost dies, but then doesn't. 40 go to 10. What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable plot device? Well, what will happen when we throw a beanbag chair into an industrial grinder? Something that would make spectacular fodder for whimsical YouTube videos, no doubt, but it's hard to get dramatically invested. And then you call upon it whenever you want in battle, and as long as you've got the magic power, it'll pop out and serve whatever's in front of it with tartar sauce and a slice of lemon. Which does pretty significantly innovate upon the existing combat in the way the Battle of Teutoburg Forest significantly innovated upon on the 17th Legion. It's the classic sequel problem that an attempt to escalate the gameplay with bigger and better powers has the effect of just making it easier. You wonder even more why any of the enemies would feel motivated to show up for work when their target can at any moment throw all her clothes off and make a giant woman in high heels appear and stomp on their testic- oh I just thought of an explanation actually. Turns out Bayonetta 3 has bigger problems than not paying its voice actors a big enough puppy murdering stipend or whatever that was about. I guess it just feels like we're going through the motions. The motions in this case meaning madly gyrating our naked pelvis as Mothra with tits is conjured from thin air and proceeds to hose down the enemy with torpedoes launched from its terrifying nipples, and yeah, that would certainly have been a noteworthy thing to happen in, say, Modern Warfare 2, but for Bayonetta it's the baseline. Tiresome, tiresome, tiresome. Gosh, I'm glad I'm getting some use out of this word a day calendar. Their handling of their signature franchise has been like watching two blind sea urchins trying to get through their wedding night. Any half-decent idea for a Sonic game in their hands is as much use as a professional grade drawing tablet at a finger painting class for baboons. I've said many mean things about Sonic Team in the past, and currently, and in the very near future as well. Sonic Frontiers sucks balls. Well, hmm. See, insofar as I look forward to anything, I was looking forward to Sonic Frontiers, because my game reviewer Gut Instinct, forged over many years in the crucible of disappointment and cake, told me that open world design may well be the thing that finally makes 3D Sonic work. Or it's going to totally suck balls, and either case will at least be fun to write about. The actual result is a mixed bag. Sonic and pals fly to some island for some reason. There's a big cock up and Sonic's pals get trapped in cyberspace or something. And when Sonic wakes up alone in the pouring rain in a washed out landscape surrounded by the imposing ruins of a once vibrant civilization as haunting music plays, I felt not for the first time a strong urge to grab the Sonic franchise by the lapels, shake it back and forth and yell FIGURE OUT YOUR FUCKING TONE! You are a fucking cartoon mouse in sneakers, you are a concept for babbies, you are not Death Stranding. You are not Attack on Titan, you are not whatever the fuck Sonic 2006 was trying to be, possibly Final Fantasy X if it was mashed up with some staggeringly uncomfortable slash fiction. But I was tentatively having fun with the core gameplay until I got to the first giant boss at the end of the first island and then went oh okay this sucks balls, thank you for freeing me from my world of uncertainty. You have to do them as supersonic within a time limit set by your ring count, except the boss sets the pace of the fight so there's very little you can do to kill it faster, it keeps knocking you away and by the time you've wrestled the camera back around to see what it's doing you're just in time for it to knock you away again, and then if you fail and reload you have to restart with only a hundred rings, no matter how many you started with. Thanks a bunch game, I'll do a much better job now I've got a quarter of the time limit and a raging hate boner restricting blood flow to my brain. So yeah, Sonic Team fucked up again. In many ways it's reassuring. Nice to know there's some stability in the world. Whatever happens, the sun will still rise in the morning.
morning, Sonic Team will still fuck up, and a seagull's still gonna react poorly to having a cricket ball in its throat. But maybe it shouldn't have gotten big ideas about my bag of chips, Jeffrey. Tell you what, Sony, let's make a deal. I'll stop telling everyone you're a bunch of prissy corpo scum who stopped giving us review codes because we had too much self-respect to gargle your gnats, and in return you stop making me squeeze through narrow caves. Yeah, I know you're using it to hide loading, but surely the fact that we all know that means you can drop the pretense. Just use a fucking loading screen, maybe with a map, little moving red line like an Indiana Jones, have fun with it. Every time you make me squeeze through a narrow cave now, I feel like you're insulting my intelligence. Tee hee, he'll never suspect we're zooming right up on Kratos' acne scars to hide the fact that we're swapping in another pointlessly over-detailed environment for the 17th millionth time, and I feel my review is best encapsulated by a moment of revelation I had about 20 hours in, as I emerged from narrow cave passageway number 8012. This has all the qualities of a good game, I thought. The visuals are polished to a mirror sheen, the set pieces are impressive, the combat functions. The story's actually pretty good, with lots of characters with distinct personalities and complex motives and clean underpants and noses and all the other shit you need. It is exactly the sort of thing that an absolute searing twat in the YouTube comments would call objectively good. So, that all being the case, why does the sense that I'm barely halfway through the fucking thing fill me with abject misery? There's a bit where Kratos decides to consult the Fates. He's got a relationship with the Fates, going back to God of War 2 when he made pasta pictures out of their intestines, and that kicks off a whole chapter where we dog sled across the map, find a cave, murder some dudes, find it was the wrong cave, dog sled back across the map, find another wrong cave, back a third time, find the right cave, prove our worth through three set pieces and more dude murdering, and then finally get our meeting and the fates go, fuck off Kratos, and Kratos fucks off. Oh, and kill Heimdall I guess. And that literal entire chapter was just to tell him to kill Heimdall. Definitely one of those meetings that could have been an email situations. Meanwhile Kratos Jr. has a chapter where he goes to sleep and wakes up in a Roger Dean album cover, where he meets Manic Pixie Exposition Girl, the amazing human plot device, whose entire job is to explain shit, and for crikey the story department must have sacrificed a lot of break room privileges to get to include her, probably why she won't tell us shit till we've literally helped her with her shopping for a fucking hour. But I got quite into Slay the Spire recently, so I was in the mood for this kind of shit. Here we most emphatically do not bring up Marvel Snap. Midnight Sun's combat adds a very XCOM-like focus on positioning and environment. Ooh, XCOM with the X-Men, then all home to play on the Xbox, and have some X- Benedict, fuck you, I'm trying. And while everything was fine in the combat when the camera was up high benevolently looking down on all the Tonka toys fighting, when you get to ground level to start making moony eyes at them you notice the graphics are absolute knicker elastic. Blimey, I thought Gotham Knights had bland art, guess Marvel wasn't about to be shown up by their old rival, because mid-shite bums looks like the fucking Sims. Everyone's got unblemished skin and plasticine hairdos, Tony Stark looks like a haunted action figure of Freddie Mercury, which I could have gotten part if the characters had had a bit more life to them, but when I took Blade on a fishing trip and we spent the whole time posing on the riverbank, ineffectually dangling a rod like we're at the urinal together, or like I think was, if I go in for the snog I'm gonna create some kind of awkwardness singularity. And as for the dialogue, I get the sense that off-screen Tony Stark has been nobbing his way around headquarters, spreading that venereal disease that makes you try to force a quip into every single fucking line of dialogue, so it's like being Joss Whedon at an audition, getting quipped at by tryhards at every turn while trying to figure out which one you want to sexually harass. If there was ever a game crying out for some kind of spectacle fighter mechanic that rewards the player for varying their approach, it's this one, because by the end your available variety of attacks would shame a battleship crewed by poisonous hedgehogs. Standard punch, uppercut, electric punch, clearing electric punch, sneaky interrupt kick in the bollocks, parry shield, electric lasso, six shooters, shotgun, rifle, crossbow, flamethrower, glory kills, super duper attack with ten minute cooldown, I haven't even gotten to the facetious made up examples yet, grenade launcher, minigun, hedge trimmer, angry cat in a bag, and there we go. There's even a multiplayer option on the title screen. I can't remember the last time I saw that. A single player game with an included, entirely separate multiplayer mode that doesn't try to awkwardly smash them together into a live service grindathon. That certainly does evoke a bygone age. Thanks for the memories, Evil West. You gonna try out the multiplayer mode that- Nope. Poor old Jacob Lee can't catch a break. First he has to deal with people always asking him if he's still making movies with Kevin Smith, then his space truck explodes over an evil space prison, and he gets thrown into the space prison for some unclear crime, possibly littering. Then all the prisoners get infected with zombie virus and become more interested in twatting Jacob Lee to death than in trading cigarettes for hand jobs. And if all that weren't enough to put the bow on Jacob Lee's shitty day, he then has to spend the next ten hours being the protagonist of a fucking awful video game. Still, the core combat has more of a melee focus than Dead Space, I know because I walked out of my cell at the start of the game and got immediately twatted to death by the first enemy. The game was trying to teach me how to dodge, you see. Hold in a direction and Jacob will automatically dodge, it said. Oh, well that's kind of an original dodge mechanic. Is this direction okay? No! Now watch a five minute death animation as the enemy shoves its fist down Jacob's throat and uses him as a washing up glove. This happened twice in a row. I think you're supposed to push in the direction away from where the attack's coming from. Or towards it. Or corresponding to which limb the enemy's attacking with. Or their zodiac sign. Honestly it always felt random whether I'd pick the right direction to dodge in. But then I have trouble making rational decisions when a dude with a face like a Rice Krispie treat is sprinting towards me with one hand raised and a pile of dirty dishes in the other. Also, if you run out of ammo during a fight then you're fucked, because the painfully slow reload and switch weapon animations don't count if they're interrupted. And 
and they will be. Because these furious rejects seasonal McDonald's burgers on legs are very aggressive and very keen to get their washing up done. If you need to heal up in combat, then you're double fucked because Jacob can't just man up and jam the glowing green needle in his neck. He's got to slowly crouch and carefully lay down a little picnic blanket to sit on first. Also, also, we can't swing our melee weapons straight away if it's currently holstered. So I'd take it out and try to keep it ready while creeping through the hallways, looking for the inevitable next ambush. And Dumbo Tits here keeps fucking holstering it again without me asking. You need both hands to pick your fucking nose or something? Oh, and the animators must have been particularly proud of the 3D printing sequence at the upgrade station because we have to sit through the whole fucking thing every time we buy any upgrade for our guns, and over and over again if we bought one right before one of the frustratingly hard boss fights because the thought of putting in an autosave after the upgrade station apparently slipped everyone's minds while they were rendering another seven different ways to pull Jacob Lee's knackers off. Unique monster design replaced with generic cornflake zombies, who were of course created by a generic alien parasite, dredged up from a generic ancient ruin, and then deliberately spread by generically evil rich people for generic super soldier reasons, and then after a generic final boss fight against a generic monster man, the plot has the sheer gall to end on a cliffhanger. Read the room, Callisto Protocol. Bet the last ten hours of punches to the bollocks have whetted your appetite for an additional mule kick to the prostate. The fundamental flaw of cat piss pokeballs is that its core gameplay demands a speed of thought and action that the sluggish control and animations disallow. As I say, frustration and horror are not the same thing. Horror is discovering what your overweight grandma did to your toilet, frustration is trying to get an emergency plumber around on Thanksgiving weekend. And so we reach the end of 2022, or as it will be known by future generations, the year what Elden Ring come out in. You know when they reboot a franchise and use the same name, they always end up having to stick the year it came out on the end? As with Sonic the Hedgehog open brackets 2006 and Doom open brackets 2016? This is going to be the opposite of that. The year 2022 will forever be known as 2022 open brackets when Elden Ring come out. Not that I want to spoil too much of what you should expect from this, the zero punctuation top five, bottom five, and blandest five of the preceding year, although I'll spoil one more thing, neither God of War Ragnarok nor Sonic Frontiers appear in any of the following lists. Hopefully this time the YouTube video won't have to sit atop its comments like a squirrel being dangled over a sack of understimulated pit bulls. As always, the Game Awards showers its indie prizes on whatever passing trend gains sufficient buzz to be deemed worthy of hanging with the cool kids, even if it is just a linear hike whose core gameplay lacks any noteworthy feature besides a butthole concealing algorithm. It's Stray, a game that you can recreate at home if you happen to own a cat and a laser pointer shaped like a contextual button prompt. Hell Pie is a game that actually plays pretty well with nuanced platforming mechanics and interesting varied environments. Unfortunately, it's also, in a very literal sense, gross as shit, and thus all that effort was tragically wasted. I mean, 2001 A Space Odyssey is considered one of history's greatest films, but that would not be the case if every time you turned it on, Stanley Kubrick ran out and jizzed in your eye. <laughs> There's a game coming out next year inspired by Jet Set Radio called Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, and I've already declared that to be the most abusable name of any video game in history. My mind reels at the possibilities, I can get three swears in there easy. But until it comes out, Fartface Shitcaker will retain the title. You remember that meditative game about spaceship dismantling. I liked it, fuck you. I feel iffy about condemning things I don't understand. Maybe there are other people with different cultural backgrounds for whom this game's story is a searing emotional roller coaster rather than a room full of deranged circus seals banging kitchenware together. But I guess I can only ever speak from my own experience, which reliably informs me that Stranger of Paradise Anal Man to See Squidgy Bums is a load of old piss on a freshly laundered pillow. <laughs> <sighs> okay, hear me out. Elden Ring is a fantastically realised world and a great natural progression of the Dark Souls legacy that, rarity of rarities, I kept playing in my spare time, all seven weekly minutes of it. But I can't in good conscience call it my game of the year because I stopped about three or four bosses before the end and never felt the desire to go back. Like many men my age, I struggle with souls-like fatigue, but if you give generously, perhaps hope can be found for those who suffer from this debilitating social illness. I hope the next From Software game has a decent fucking ending for once. <laughs> Nothing like a turd so sphincter-stretchingly big its own publisher shuts it down after six months. Babylon's Fall is an ugly, boring, confusing tripe lollipop that already failed so hard there's little point in berating it further. It's so bad it made me retroactively hate Babylon 5 just by association. It's just fucking Deep Space Nine but set on a giant bicycle pump. In the end, there was only one game that always came to mind first when I thought of my favourites of the year. Yes, I was a little down on the whole Wanamay beach episode, accidental panty shot, ooh notice me senpai, no not like that you perv vibe of the plot, but Neon White's core gameplay loop is very strong and has a wonderfully breezy innovative spirit that you just don't get from games that have to drag their oversized development budgets around with them like two fat horse carcasses in a bag. 
blandness is relative, really. If you took Saints Row open brackets 2022 by itself, it'd probably seem far from bland compared to most of its peers, but unfortunately it has to be weighed against the previous Saints Row games, and the moment they get dropped on the scale, Saints Row open brackets 2022 gets catapulted into a ditch. And then its dreary attempt to get back into its decades-old bed with only the tokenist attempt to refresh the linen is what pushes the dirt over it to finally bring an end to this severely mixed metaphor. <laughs> Considering I gave Kark Place Tit Shaker a prize, it shouldn't surprise you to hear that I feel a bit out of touch with the kids. I cannot comprehend how anyone can look at Security Breach and see anything but a horrendously badly thought out six lane pileup of a game, riddled with terrible design decisions and misplaced effort, held together about as efficiently as a swarm of angry wasps in a fishing net. But the popularity of Five Nights at Freddy's mystifies me generally, so maybe I'm the wrong demographic. Maybe this is like complaining that there's no driving philosophical theme at the heart of Peppa Pig's pumpkin party.